By now, we all have a clear vision of what impact climate change has on our planet. Pushed by the Paris Agreement, the energy transition is here to stay. But even in the best case scenario, we still have an abundance of 1,500 gigaton of CO2. It took us humans 150 years to release it, and we need to take it out as soon as possible. 1,500 gigaton is difficult to imagine, but what about this? That's the same amount as is already stored by all plants and trees on Earth right now, on land and in the oceans. Oh, and did we forget to tell? That's because nature grows from CO2. So the challenge is clear. To clean up 1,500 gigaton, we only have to double nature. True, that sure is a huge challenge, but it can still be done. And often, it's even a viable business case. And people like challenges, right? This one is energizing, that's a promise. The fact is, it must be done. And the good news is, it's already happening. Let's double nature. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening or good day, depending on what part of the planet you're on right now. A very warm welcome from the Westhaven studios here in Amsterdam to celebrate the first anniversary of the Climate Cleanup 1500 Club. And to do that, we have a very festive masterclass for you. So it will be fun and educational. With us tonight are many frontrunners like Rose and Ruth Kornstra, Sven Jensen next to me at the table, and of course, Linda Vosjan, who obviously couldn't leave her bike at home. Could you, Linda? No, actually, I'm a front cycler uh, <laughs> tonight. Hmm. And it's because I'm standing with uh, Cycling for Climate, our member, uh, Joost Brinkman, who's also in the room with lots of friends. He's cycling all the time for the climate. So I thought I'm going to bring my desk bike, my Corona desk bike. And, uh, and I'm also going to, um, to moderate the chat. So please, everyone can put questions in the chat or remarks. And Tijn and me, we will try to, uh, to, to uh, put some uh, uh, nice questions forward. Yeah, please do that. We'll be back to you later on. Tijn, you were uh, already mentioned by Linda. You're with the Climate Cleanup Intervention Team. Uh, what did you bring uh, tonight? There's a laptop in front of you. Yeah, well, thank you, Arm. Um, if you see my screen at the moment, can you see my uh, the map I'm uh, showing? I hope you can uh, give us the map, otherwise tell me about it. Um, well, we have a map, um, mm -hmm. and I, I still can't see the map in the background. So I... No, but later on it might be there. Yeah. What's on the map? Tell me. Well, we have a map, and um, we're, we're now uh, in Amsterdam. Um, and if you zoom out, you see all the different cool initiatives that are working on the, on the climate solutions. So you zoom out from Amsterdam towards the Netherlands, towards the world. Yeah, yeah. So and we, how we, many uh, places are already linked together? In the, um, you know? Almost almost the entire world. Entire world. <laughs> this, this is really good news. So um, we'll be back to you later on. And I think that's really essential to, to think big when we want to double nature, which is actually what we want to do. We'll be back uh, later with you. Linda, uh, uh, what is there uh, next to you at the ground? On yeah. The uh, so uh, all our members, they, uh, we sent this box to mm -hmm. their home. So please get your box if you didn't do that yet, because you, you're going to need all the things that are inside. And um, we really want to thank member Inge de Becker of Hospitality Group, who was so kindly to help us with all kinds of organizational stuff for this double nature talk extra large uh -huh. for this masterclass. And to get the box filled, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, let's see how they did that. We have a short video, please watch. Hi, we are Lynette Verduin and L and Claire Wenger, young professionals at Hospitality Group. One of our CEOs, Inge de Becker, is a member of the Climate Cleanup Foundation. Uh, as a company, Hospitality Group works to create inspiring and sustainable environments, and we do so through hospitality, facility management, procurement and corporate housing. Hospitality Group has increasingly focused on setting up socially responsible business operations. For that, we have collaborated with Climate Cleanup Foundation several times. We, as young professionals, are supporting the Climate Cleanup Foundation 
uh, with the organization of the masterclass. Among others, we've helped with the promotion of the masterclass, the packaging of the gift packages and the registrations. It's been very exciting for us to work on this event and we are proud to be sponsor and partner of this inspiring foundation. We hope you'll have a lot of fun with this masterclass. We hope that it inspires you and that you enjoy it. If you're not a member of the Climate Kingdom Foundation yet, become a member. Join the regeneration. Thank you very much, Inge de Becker, and all your young professionals. Dan, you found your map. Yeah, I, I found it. It was uh, hidden somewhere, but uh, now so we... Please uh, show us. We are at the Climate Solutions Masterclass. That's pretty clear. Yeah, yeah. so this uh, this is in Amsterdam West. And if you zoom out, you can see all the initiatives and people and projects that are... Uh, Annie van Hout, I saw, in Zandam. Annie van Hout in yeah, uh, Zandam. It's really also handy. from the Climate Cleanup team. And if you zoom out, you can see we're not uh, only working in the Netherlands. Belgium coming in, Germany. But we're working... England and the United States, South America. It's all over the world. It's calculating now where all the points are. Yeah, it's, so a, it's a bit a too much. But slight uh, Wi-Fi problem, but they're popping in. Great. Yeah, so Australia. Yeah. America. Everywhere. Oh, Everywhere. Gives a good feeling, right? Another good feeling today. Breaking news in the courtroom. Shell against Friends of the Earth. And guess what? Shell lost. Fernand, a big win then for campaigners here. Tell us a bit more about what the court decided. So, yes, yeah, really a historic win. Uh, the court decided, first of all, that the Dutch uh, court had legis had a jurisdiction in this case. That was a first question. Shell had said that consumers uh, were responsible for what they put out and that um, countries where that was omitted were responsible. However, the court said that uh, it could rule on this. Uh, now, historically, they said that Shell will have to cut their emissions by 45% from the 2019 baseline. Um, and they will have to do that in the next 10 years by 2030. So they really have to speed it up. Now, of course, this court can't say how they have to do that. They have to say that Shell has to do that themselves. But they do say that Shell has the right to set policy and that policy has an impact on the environment, on the emission standards, and that has an impact on us all. So they put out an order on Shell today that they must reduce those emissions by 2030, by court order. Yeah, good news then for... That's quite something, Sven. Yeah, and this is really a super, it makes this a super festive day because uh, our board member, Donald Pols, actually took the initiative to this case. So. We're really proud of him and happy and uh, want to give him a big congratulations. Yeah, congratulations from all of us. And let's hope that many, many other countries will follow swiftly. Um, Sven, a year ago, you initiated Climate Cleanup. We were in the same studio. Everything started. Was it a good year? It was an extremely good year. It was a corona year, but people started connecting and entrepreneurs started uh, connecting. And we, should, we really started to see it as a family. So... Um, so tonight is about connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. So a year of building up, and we saw all the points at Tyne's map, and now it's uh, connecting time. Yeah, well, people really work against uh, um, uh, against uh, the, the times of sickness and, 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 and everything, but we, we see it getting to work now. Good. Yep. There's something rather huge beside you. What is it? Um, yeah, well... <clears throat> <laughs> It's, a, it's a, sort of a hammer. <laughs> it is. I dropped it on the table in the rehearsal. And they yeah, were like, oh, our don't, table. Don't do that again. Um, Why did you no, a hammer? it's for our uh, chairperson, Ruth. Ruth Kornstra. Um, because last year he uh, gave, uh, gave me this axe mm -hmm. and um, to put at the uh, roots of the fossil uh, economy. Well, that's been taken care of today. So um, this year I am uh, handing Ruth this uh, hammer. So this is probably why he doesn't dare to be at the table right now. Um, that's for later. As a chairman, you need a big hammer in these days. Oh, so he does. Ruth will be back here later. Uh, the funny thing, ladies and gentlemen, I think you need a hammer at home too. So please get up. We're not only going to talk about climate change. We all get depressed. We need some real action. So get up, find a hammer somewhere in your home. I look at all the audiences. Some people actually get up, find yourself a hammer, and we'll have good use of it later on in the show. Um, Sven, I think in the meantime, this might be a perfect moment for you to say something personal to all of us. 
Uh, yeah, because a year ago you actually uh, taught me to how to speak on a camera. I had mm. no idea. Uh, and you did. Um, and um, so now I wrote a column. I thought, well, why not do it on the teleprompter? As you said, that's cool. Right? We have a teleprompter? We do. Why didn't I know that? Oh, okay, you have a teleprompter. So uh, it's, it, it's a special it skill, is. but do some training on the job. Um, ladies and gentlemen, a very personal word from Sven Jensen. <clears throat> okay, let me try. So we live in an extraordinary moment, in extraordinary time. We humans started to take over the world about 12,000 years ago. That's about 1,200, no, about 500 generations. So 500 generations of exponential growth happened with the population doubling ever faster. We again doubled in our single lifetimes. But this doubling was a special one because it has been the last time. Because right now, the curve has bent. And this time, it's not because of hunger or COVID or other disease. It's because people are more educated and independent than ever. And we are moving from unbridled population growth towards an equilibrium. Or we will collapse. Because there is one challenge. We destroyed most of nature and destabilized our climate. And now is the time to also bend that curve. This is our task today. Jonas Salk is the father of this image. Jonas was the inventor of the polio vaccine. He saved millions of lives. Salk not only saw the bend in the, in the curve coming, um, he also realized that people born before the bend, they thrived with competition. While well, those born after the bend or on the bend know and feel they only win through collaboration. As a fact, they develop a regenerative mindset because they know it is the only way to survive and enjoy life in harmony. And things are bad. We all know things are bad. But the necessary changes are happening. And we are the drivers of this revolution. We know we must double nature because this removes 1,500 gigaton of CO2 and restores life on Earth. Our pastures are dead and we will revive them. Our oceans are empty and we will restore them. Our way of producing stuff, materials, now cancels out our future and we will reverse that. And of course, we'll stop emissions. Energy from the sun and wind is now cheap and abundant. Recently, also the International, International Energy Agency, they finally admitted that the growth of clean wind and solar has consistently been underestimated. And not by a little. And this is great news, because it also means that all predictions and projections about clean energy are still severely underestimated. And the power of energy, well, that's a tautology. Right. So energy will be free, practically, in the not too distant future. And our clean energy will power the growth and reuse of clean regenerative materials. This clean energy will power the growth of what we now call the new nature economy. And tonight, the vanguard of this emerging economy presents itself. And these front runners teach us it can be done. But while the change has started, it will not happen by itself. It'll take hard work. It'll take creativity, courage, and persistence. And at this stage, we still work along huge vested interests. On land, agriculture is dominated by a solid and lucrative system of banks, producers of animal feed and fertilizer, powerful sales channels, and so on. The energy sector is still dominated by fossil old plant companies, all rushing towards their Kodak moments with their personal golden caged. The construction sector isn't any better. Clean concrete, right? That's like clean coal. Sounds nice, but still steals the future from our children. So we will be clever. We will stick together. 
we will dare to see the emerging new nature economy and get out there and create it. We'll take care of each other. We will cherish our relationships. We'll envision, we'll calculate, we will connect and we will create, and we will act. The climate entrepreneurs you'll meet tonight are not here accidentally. They work on exactly these solutions that are scalable and regenerative, and we urge all of them, all of you, to support them with all you have, because they need support with courageous capital on long time horizons. They need support with sharing their stories, with policies enabling their distributed growth. And it's not just money. We need to come together and seriously ask, what do you need? What needs actually to be done? We need to be trim tabs. It's the great system thinker and creator Buckminster Fuller who said this once, trim tabs. So imagine a ship, a tall ship sailing past, past us. And at the end of that ship, there's the rudder. And at the very end of that rudder, there's a little tiny rudder. And this is the rudder. This rudder is called the trim tab. And the thing is, one small person can move this trim tab. This trim tab then will move the big rudder, which then immediately will turn the big ship 180 degrees around. And we are creating these trim tabs. That's what Climate Cleanup has set out for. And we invite all of you to join our fleet. Because each and every one of our ancestors succeeded in surviving before they passed on life to younger generations. And let us not break that chain. Let's regenerate life. Let's remove carbon. Let's double nature and recreate our future. Let us live, let us love and care and try to understand nature and again, become an integrated part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. That was remarkable and easy from a teleprompter. Yeah. Well done. Very easy. And I think the world will hear you loud and clear. And let me add that we cannot change alone. Ladies and gentlemen, human beings are simply not designed to do that. So we must change together, then we really can do it. And the, the good thing is, when we change together to make that new sustainable world, it's fun. So then we're back to educational and fun. Uh, so without further ado, let's continue on what has to be done. I understand it's relatively easy. We have three watts tonight. And the first one is, uh, well, let's come to that. Everybody at home, um, get the box in front of you. Um, Linda, what is in the box that they need to take out? Yeah, uh, in the box, you will find this tiny plant. And yeah, and Sven has e even got a smaller yeah, it's one. It's a very tiny Yeah, there were really tiny plants in, in the boxes. And, uh, but they stand for the big power of regreening the planet. Mm -hmm. And it all starts with the seeds, seeds and little plants, and it grows. Yeah. But that's important. And the, the word we need tonight on the table is agroforestry, right? Yes. This is what we want to go to. And remember, it's still a masterclass. So uh, let's watch a short video. This land could transition to a range of regenerative practices that draw down vast amounts of carbon into the soil while retaining precious water and producing nutrient-dense food. Instead of soy or grains, we could feed the animals grass, crop residue, or food waste. This would improve the health of the animals, the people who choose to eat them, and our environment. The steep crop lands around the world could be used to grow foods that also draw down huge amounts of carbon. A practice called agroforestry does this by simultaneously growing foods like pawpaw, bananas, coffee, 
avocados or vegetables. is to regenerate 1 million hectares of land by 2030. Join us to renature. Agroforestry, fascinating, isn't it? Our next two guests know much more about it. The first one is in the Zoom, Daniela Denis, and the second one is uh, next to me at the table, Felipe Villela. It's a very different Difficult to pronounce last name. As Spen, perfect. Where did you know? Uh, how did you know yeah. these guys? Great that you're here, Philippe and Danielle. We have um, uh, we met in Prodoc, and you uh, when you were with just two people, and you said we're gonna make regenerative agroforestry mainstream, and with two people, uh, and and you're doing it. So it's fantastic to see you again. Uh, uh, now we were in the in the west or Westport in Amsterdam actually when we first met. So that's about the same place over here. And and Danielle is also a creator and a, a founder of Weiland, um, uh, uh, which means meadow and also we land. And um, we are really an, you're really an example for us because you're one of those systemic thinkers and doers uh, who look for trim tabs and then create them. So um, great to, uh, that you're here. It's the word of the night, isn't so it? Much. Trim tabs. Yeah, welcome, Daniel. Philippe, can I start with you? What, in your own words, is regenerative farming? How should we describe that? Well, regenerative farming is just not, the, you know, the most effective way for uh, mitigating our climate crisis, but it's the only way we can actually ensure food security for our growing world population. Mm -hmm. Regenerative farming is a way of farming in, with harmony in, with nature. So it's basically mimicking the processes of nature so that we can grow food in a way that can restore biodiversity, restore the water cycle, and has a positive impact on food security for our future population. And in the meantime, trees capturing carbon, and it's all happening in there. Absolutely. So in tropical climates, of course, you use trees uh, consorted with other species so that you can have a more positive effect on carbon sequestration and stock, stock in the soil. So for instance, in Brazil, we work in agroforestry plot that sequesters 45 tons uh, per hectare per year of uh, carbon, mm -hmm. which is a tremendous amount for uh, average uh, farmland. Uh, so, you know, by the more complex agroforestry the systems gets, the more carbon you can capture. Yeah. But you're from Brazil. Everything grows fantastically in Brazil. We're in the Netherlands. It's yeah. a different story altogether. Can it be used all over the world? Is it a really scalable climate solution? Can we feed approximately 9 billion people in the world? Absolutely. So... Regenerative is not only being done, you know, from a small perspective, you know, in, with small holders or in small plots, but it has been done in large scale. So we're working, for instance, in projects that has over thousands of hectares that has been adopting regenerative practices. And of course, there are challenges in, in, in scaling regenerative and agroforestry plots, which is mechanizations. We need new machineries and technology that different can support. Ones. Exactly. Different Larger ones. ones. You know, mm. so John Deere and all these mechanized organizations has to adapt to this change in agriculture systems because the corpus they are investing in it. So they, it has, you know, like a demand now growing. Demand and the growing potential. Are these Absolutely. huge uh, technical companies, are they listening to you? Yeah, so now we are talking to some of the technical companies, but first we are creating more demand, you know, so we are reaching out to a large supply chains of corporates working, for instance, for Nespresso. So hopefully George Clooney can drink a, sure. a regenerative coffee coming from uh, that. Uh, yeah, from wrapped up in banana leaves. Exactly. Might be a second career for him altogether. <laughs> Danielle, um, we're in the Netherlands, as I already said earlier. Um, how can this system change the Dutch agricultural system? Uh, how can we uh, adapt to that? Yeah, so I think uh, the context of regenerative agriculture is very different in every landscape that you work. Now, we work in the peat meadows. Um, so peaty soils, and they have their own dynamics. Um, and um, we also think it's very important to protect our meadow birds. So planting trees is not always a good idea. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot that farmers can do to work towards uh, better soils, more resilience, 
more diversity on their farms. So we are working with a network of about 140 farmers that are regenerating over 1,000 hectares of soils uh, with direct impact in our, uh, our pilots. And actually, the indirect impact is much more because if you regenerate agricultural soils, you also have an impact on water bodies and on nature. And we all know we have a huge nitrogen problem in the Netherlands, yeah. which we can also. So everything comes back to how we use our soils, how we uh, manage our soils, and we can find multiple solutions from multiple problems. Yeah, so the droughts and everything. Biodiversity and right. carbon. Yeah. We're really uh, curious how you actually do that. So uh, we made a short video. Let's watch it. The beauty of life, of, of biology, of living things is that they have a capacity to heal. Het leven op aarde is afhankelijk van de natuur. Ze geeft ons zuurstof, voedsel en bescherming. Door slecht gebruik van ons landschap en de bodem is een oppervlakte ter grootte van twee keer China gedegradeerd. Als we kijken naar het Nederlands Veenweidegebied, dan zien we een ogenschijnlijk groene oase. Maar ook hier neemt de kwaliteit van bodem en natuur af. Dit alles is het gevolg van een overheersende focus op financiële opbrengst per hectare. De economie past niet in de ecologie. Een onhoudbare situatie. Je mergelt eigenlijk de grond uit. Op korte termijn lijkt het alsof je met kunstmest en bestrijdingsmiddelen hogere producties haalt. Maar voor de langere termijn ben ik ervan overtuigd dat dat alleen maar interen is op onze, onze aarde. While a tremendous amount of the planet is degraded, um, it, it's not the end of the road. We, we, we can absolutely turn what we're doing and, and, and correct all of these uh, degradations. And that's a, that's a very hopeful, you know, a very wonderful thing. Yeah, the long term, this is a really important sentence. Danielle, we need to scale up and we need to speed up. And I know about a lot of projects in the Netherlands alone that are doing similar things. Do you know, are you interconnecting? Do you team up to, to speed things up? Um, well, that's actually the next phase of Rylan. So we've been really been focusing on the, building the trust in the network in the farmers, uh, also to talk about more challenging uh, changes like soil subsidence in, uh, in the peat meadows. Um, and also exchanging uh, knowledge in that farmer group. And now I think the next phase is that we will wanna, we have built some instruments and tools uh, that work towards regenerative agriculture. And we would like to share that with other uh, regional networks that are working towards the same goals. Yeah, fantastic. Please share. That's what we need to speed things up. Philippe, we have uh, eight and a half years left when, and then we reach the year 2030 which is a very important milestone year. Where should agroforestry and regenerative farming be by then? How far are we? Yeah, so, you know, in order for us to really reach our global sustainability targets to, you know, the net zero, uh, I think the most important thing that we should do is like to reach out to large, you know, context of agriculture, supply chains from corporates that has a huge impact on landscapes. So, you know, now we're really focusing on, on, on supporting uh, the corporates in the transition mm -hmm. because it's a long transition and all these farmers that, you know, belongs to such corporates, they are really willing to learn about the, the other methods. Yeah. So it's, it's now you're the sort time. Of scared whether you have uh, enough supply and if there's enough continuity, but as soon as you can take them along, they might just walk with you. Exactly. So the willingness to transition is something that is, it really is accountable for these farmers. So once the, the corpus, they are willing to invest in this transition and we look into transition finance to really enable these farmers uh, with the cost that it, the, in, it's implicit to the transition, mm -hmm. then we can really support them, you know, with the technical assistance and also connecting with offtake mm -hmm. agreements because there's a lot of regenerative farms that still doesn't know where to sell their products. Yeah. So that's so, the mainstream and then you can speed up. 
Exactly. And you're from Brazil, so you're lucky. <laughs> but I love the Netherlands. I've been here <laughs> yeah, but we for love six, Brazil. six years. So, yeah. So it's a uh, I'm I'm I speak speak climb vision in Netherlands, but oh, not uh... stick to the English. Oh, well, it's quite <laughs> impressive actually. Sven, yeah. uh, when we really start doing all this, how much, how many carbon dioxide tons can we actually reduce? Well, it's about life, but the drawdown tells us it's 23.95 uh, megatons at least. Gigatons. Gigatons well, in yeah. 2050. Yeah, so it's a at huge least. amount, and it really makes a difference if we do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It absolutely. does. It's uh, as simple as that. Yeah. yeah. Linda, yeah. any questions? Well, uh, Harm, actually, I would like, like to give the floor to Annemarie Pronk. Uh, Annemarie is there. Yeah, she's. Uh, Waking up now. Maybe you could, could uh, because she's always um, uh, uh, explaining her uh, feelings about uh, what we are doing in such a explicit way, and she did it in the chat as well. So, oh. uh, and maybe Anna Marie could could speak to some words to uh, Climate Cleanup and all the members and all the guests. Please do. Yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah, I read a lot about climate psychology and we um, have worked uh, the last 10, 20 years with a uh, few on humankind that we are homo economicus, that we only care about ourselves. And that's called the myth of apathy. And I was very uh, inspired by uh, the words of Sven. Um, and I think it's very important to have this spirit that we are working together and we, can, we are made for um, uh, solving problems together. So, yeah, it's very inspiring. Thank you very much. Oh, it's good to hear. And the good thing is I just finished Rutger Bregman's book, Most People uh, Deuger. Uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, well, we really want to solve stuff with all of us. And um, uh, despite COVID, the environmental issues are still on the third level of what's on people's minds despite all the problems we are dealing with right now. So it stays high up in the attention of people. So this is the time to change. Philippe and Daniel, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. And uh, at home, I uh, want to do a little quiz with you. Uh, take the box, put it in front of you, and there's some brown stuff in the box. And I am wondering, um, and I hope I can see people actually diving into the box at home. The brown stuff, please take it out. And the question is very simple. Uh, what is it? Does anybody know? Please wave if you can see what it is. Nobody's waving. Um, you can't smoke it. There's arsenic inside, so don't please try that at home. But actually, it's sargassum. It's a seaweed cluster from the ocean. It comes from Africa, and it goes by Brazil and goes up north to all the white sandy beaches. And we put it there because oceans are a decisive, have a decisive role in uh, making that new sustainable world we long for so deeply. And our next two guests know a lot about sarcasm and all kinds of ocean stuff. Joost Wouters is in the Zoom. Joost, welcome here tonight. And next to me at the table is Ilko Lehmans. Uh, Sven, these two people, how did you meet? Yeah, well, Joost, um, uh, Joost I met through Ruud, actually, Ruud Kornstra. Um, this is why he's our chairperson. And my best memory is when Joost, uh, when you try to explain Joost in uh, Ireland, that um, when the moon is full, it must be heavier <laughs> than when it's a half moon. <laughs> Remember? And Ilko, you were Captain Ilko. Well, first you helped uh, with many others kick uh, uh, the coal out of uh, the Amsterdam port, uh -huh. which was a good start. And then, uh, well, you actually uh, know how to sail big ships. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you do that. Yeah, I do. So, um, and you like a challenge. So when we said like 1,500 gigatons, you said, uh, yeah, let's go. I'll be chief of oceans. I'll do it. Mm. Yeah. Always very good to have somebody super, yeah. in, your, <laughs> in your friend's circle that knows how to sail a big ship, isn't it? So please be my friend too. <laughs> Okay. Um, shall we do a uh, short <laughs> ocean masterclass, shall we? Joost, you are working on something called blue farming. It's a beautiful word, but what is it? What is, do you want me to, sh to, to share about it or do you want me to show it? Oh, whatever you like. Whatever I like? Mm -hmm. All right. Then, uh, then uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go for this. And all right. <laughs> yeah. This is exciting. Yeah, I hope everybody can see it. 
Yeah, can you see it? If you can't see it. Yeah. So blue farming is actually an, 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 a way to use the incredible untapped resource being seaweed, what's on your table. And what we do is we use the blue power of the sea to actually accelerate the transition to regenerative agriculture. And we do that through our products that we have. So it's sustainable farming plus ocean regeneration at the same time. Uh -huh. And that is a way that we try to put this um, yeah, in the market in Europe, where we support the transition to sustainable organic farming, actually also building on previous uh, discussions, and at the same time, regenerating oceans and coastal communities. We have put ourselves quite some uh, impressive impact goals. And um, yeah, that's the way how we uh, look at, at, at blue farming. Right. And the good stuff is that seaweed takes a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the more you take out of the ocean, the quicker it goes. It's a very good thing. Uh, what will your next step be? When will, will it really uh, start changing the world? Oh, well, that's what we are doing already. So we are uh, we are looking for, let's say, front runner farmers, farmers that are open to, let's say, uh, to be part of that, that acceleration, that transition. And if you look, for instance, at our, uh, we have a bio growth stimulant. And if you use it over your land, and this morning we had a, a very nice uh, big, big company in the south of Holland, a beer brewery, um, and they are using it now for their barley. So they use our product and spread it over the soil so mm. the soil can absorb up to 25% more uh, carbon, uh -huh. which is a huge amount. Uh, at the same time, it will help with stronger plants that are the soil will capture more water. So it has an effect on many, many, many ways. So the, the, the seaweed is already capturing CO2 out of the air and the water. And then the, the product we make out of it is making sure that the soil can absorb more CO2. Oh, and that's we fantastic. Did, so yeah. that's, that's quite the way it works. Thank you very much. It really sounds exciting. You're connecting the dots eh, from the oceans mm -hmm. to the land. Mm -hmm. To the farmers, to all of us, and even inside Amsterdam. So the magic is actually happening. Uh, and I think that stories like this are really important to tell the normal people in the street that don't know how to come from uh, A to B to 2030 with a new climate. So this, these very nice and productive stories are really helpful. Um, Elko, you thought yep. it's, a, it's a webinar, so there's a lot of screens, so I can tape my masterclass <laughs> up front, yeah. get all the floors out, yeah. and, and then you did. Yeah, I did, yeah. So shall we yeah. just watch your masterclass? Okay, fine. Here it comes. Seventy percent of our planet is covered in oceans. So in fact, you could call it planet ocean. And the oceans play a really important role in, you know, the life forms, the ecosystems. Actually, life really started in the oceans and is really abundant. So without the oceans, life would be very different. This is also true for taking up CO2. And the oceans have taken up uh, vast amounts of CO2 in the past uh, decades, past century. And without this, the amount of CO2 right now would be up to 600 ppm. And 600 ppm would equal a temperature rise of about three and a half degrees. So at present, the Earth would be three and a half degrees warmer. And not just the end of the century, but right now. So keeping in mind that the oceans play such an important role in the whole carbon cycle, what can we do about this? And what can we learn from the oceans in how to deal with the climate crisis? I'd like to give two examples. And the first one is sargassum. Sargassum is a free-floating seaweed that is really abundant in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's well known for its existence in the Sargasso Sea. And the Sargasso Sea is a, is a sea area in the Atlantic Ocean, which is really a vital for all kinds of ecosystems. And it's well known for the fact that 
the European eel is breeding there. So baby eels get born in the Sargasso Sea. They drift all the way to Europe and live there for their whole life. And when they're mature and they want to breed, they swim all the way back to, uh, to the Sargasso Sea. Now in this Sargasso Sea, the seaweed that's floating there, when it dies, it um, sinks to the ocean floor and creating a sort of a carbon sink there. So what happens in the past decade is that this same Sargasso wheat is also drifting uh, further south in a belt from Africa to the Caribbean. And when it washes up on the coasts uh, due to the ocean currents and the winds, uh, they start to rot. And this uh, rotting sargassum releases vast amounts of CO2, but not just CO2, and also methane. And methane, as we know, is a really strong climate gas. So this causes a lot of problems. What we did with the Sargasso uh, project we've just been running is investigating what are the possibilities to deal with this um, washing up of Sargasso wheat. The second example I'd like to give is coastal wetlands. So everywhere across the planet where the oceans meet land, you will find coastal wetlands. And some of these coastal wetlands have a very delicate ecosystem. Uh, mangrove, seagrass, coral reef, etc., mudflats, and they have the uh, capacity to store vast amounts of CO2, of carbon, and uh, not just in the plants that grow there and in the coral reefs, but also in the sediment. And so in some places, thick layers of sediment store huge uh, quantities of carbon. Now, according to Drawdown, only 20% of the coastal wetlands uh, across the planet, along the planet, uh, are protected now. So in all, the oceans face huge challenges and coastal wetlands. And I would say, let's now work together with these unique ecosystems to overcome the climate crisis. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. And it's a huge project, Elko. It's gigantic. Yeah. You know, that, that this, this, this sargassum, that's this stuff. You were looking at it. Mm -hmm. I, saw, I saw you were looking at This is dried sargassum that was brought here by our team members, uh, Peter and Fons. They picked it up in the, the island of St. Martin mm -hmm. and, and dried it and brought it here. And um, so the sargassum is washing up and is floating between Africa and the Caribbean. But you can't and emphasize enough that these are huge bits, like 80 yeah. kilometers long, 30 wide. Yeah. It's just tremendous amount of sargassum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And a long time ago, I was a chief officer on a sailing ship with uh, uh, students, and we crossed from Bermuda across the Atlantic Ocean. And then all of a sudden, we saw this island in front of us, in the middle of the ocean. We couldn't believe our eyes. Is it plastic and soap? That, no. No. This was the sargassum. This was just a floating island. Amazing. Incredible. Amazing. Yeah. So it's very good to yeah. have uh, several uses for it. Yeah. You can use it as fertilizer. You can sink it to the ocean floor yeah. to get grow new seaweed growing and get more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Yeah. How far are we with the project? Uh, well, we've now uh, collected this and we are currently doing all kinds of tests uh, in cooperation with universities like the Wageningen University, with Portsmouth University and with uh, TNO. They're doing really delicate tests with all kinds of uh, incredible equipment. Mm -hmm. And actually Joost, Joost Wout, who we just heard, he is also doing some tests if we can use this as a sort of a fertilizer. Right. Yeah. Which would be great. Yeah, that would and be really great. Yeah. On top of that, you came with a sort of a report on what you were doing, a sort of plan, right? Yeah. And we would really think it's a good idea that Chairman Ruud will come to the table now. Ruud Kornstra, could you please uh, attend our small international meeting? Yeah. Hello, Ruud. 
Uh, and um, somewhere on this table is the report and uh, for you to unveil the findings if you can find it. Yeah, and do I need a hammer or a shovel? Oh, whatever you like. <laughs> no. Your hands, your hands. Okay, so I'm a facts and figure digger. Yeah, yeah. Right. figure digger. That's, that that's, good. that's yeah. something else that I call oh, yeah. digger. But, <laughs> yeah. That, that's yeah. 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 but it's... It's not a gold digger, but it's gold. It's it's a very yes, important uh, 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 please sit. document. Please sit. Yeah. <laughs> it yes. So uh, Ruth, I would say it's uh, fresh from the press. It's it's not too fresh. Though. It smells like uh, sargassum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And, and Joost, what is it? It's a report. It's a plan. What what's the use of it? So so this is the report of uh, of almost a year working on sargassum with our whole team with universities and with the people on the islands in Sint Maarten and Bonaire, etc. Mm -hmm. And with a couple of companies, among others, uh, Van Oort and Damen, you know, they're technical companies. And we've investigated all kinds of possibilities, what you can do with sargassum. Right. And it's all in this report. The report is online now, so everybody can, uh, can download it and uh, uh, you'll find all the answers to the questions about sargassum. And... and, and yeah, and, and what's the conclusion uh, in, in a one-liner? Okay, the conclusion is that uh, this stores a lot of carbon. Yes. And, uh, but how, how can you make use of it? The, uh, the best, one of the best things is to sink it to the deep sea and to create uh, a carbon sink there. Right. Yeah. So let's get everybody in to do that. This is what we need. Congratulations, everyone. And use the report. And mm. next year we'll be... Uh, way further towards a uh, better new world, yeah. especially uh, thanks to Elko and Joost and everybody at home, maybe a good idea, uh, find yourself a plant, put the sargassum inside, stuff it in the soil, sit back and relax and watch it grow. Right, we have one more ocean guest to go in the Zoom, that is Marcel Kempers, student and climate entrepreneur working on protecting corals, which is very important. Sven, where did you meet Marcel? Yeah, we met on the interwebs. Uh, on the really? internet, yeah. Out in the open. We did. Didn't we, Marcel? <laughs> on a coral forum? No, you are <laughs> you are you were connecting dots again between bio biochar, ocean solutions, and you were a student and had an old team. And you're we thought, whoa, we this is the Elon Musk, the young Elon Musk of yeah. the new nature economy. And Who he's is this guy? Really sea level as we, as we see it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> as well. yeah. So you agreed to uh, go come to double nature talk and, yeah. and happy that you're here. Before we start talking, let's see what Marcel does. What my team is working on is how we can use satellite data to break the sea land barrier. By understanding land-based activities and tracking algae growth early on, we can correlate actions and make quick changes. Satellites also allow us to determine whether dark fishing vessels are active, including what type of fishing techniques they use based on movement. We can also zone in to monitor beaches to manage human activities. And in 2017, the Sentinel-2 mission from ESA captured the first coral bleaching from space. All this, in combination with new AI-based software and reef monitoring, goes into an open map, showing which coastal regions are most at risk, bleaching, or at recovery. We can then inform and activate local efforts to precisely allocate their resources more effectively for coral restoration. By combining the fields of aerospace technology, computer science, and marine biology, we can use innovation to allow marine ecosystems to recover, which they already do so very quickly by themselves. Lastly, we want to advocate for participatory science so that we can make data about our oceans transparent and actionable. Join us at Reef Support. Yeah, good line, Marcel. Join us. Um, most of the year you hear terrible news about corals, but now and then you hear good things too, such as coral transplants, etc. How um, optimistic are you about the coral future? Yeah, hi, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the stage. You're welcome. Yeah, um, how optimistic am I? Well, not very much. So it's weird. 90% um, of our coral reefs are estimated to be gone by 2050. So you can consider it kind of like a dying market, sort of what a business or startup wants to avoid. Um, but we, leave, we believe there are actually practical actions we can take today to slow down coral loss, including a proper management of our coastal areas, um, decreasing human pollution, um, decreasing fishing activities. 
So we can slow down the factors, but the biggest cause of all is, of course, climate change mm. and the rising sea surface temperatures. Yeah. And what can we do about that? Uh, apart from saving the whole world, is there something specific you can do? Well, right now, what's really interesting, we're working on a technique called microfragmentation. This technique is barely uh, 15 years old. What, it, the, what we do, basically, we break apart corals into tiny fragments. And so corals grow up to 50 times faster. And we also grow them on land in higher temperatures so that when we put them in the water, they're actually more thermally resistant to rising temperatures. So they actually have a higher chance of survival in the future. But of course, these are new techniques and we just have to wait and see how, how it really turns out. Yeah, but I think as long as you uh, uh, stick your head in it, it will really work out fine. Thank you very much for sharing your story and keep up the good work, Marcel. Uh, Thank time. you very much. Can you point out where they actually are, um, Joost and Marcel, on the map? Yes, I can do that. Uh, first of all, the seaweed company is located in Schiedam, uh -huh. uh, in the library. Uh, they, uh, Joost told me they... The library, yeah. very good place for a seaweed company. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I, I was thinking. And uh, uh, Marcel is located in, uh, not under the ocean floor, but under, uh, uh, in Delft. He's in the, Delft. Uh, yeah. He sounds very international. Very good trick, isn't it? Yeah. Like the Bahamas or the Seychellen or... Singapore. Singapore. <laughs> just simply in Delft. Yeah. Well, please stay in the Netherlands, Marcel. Um, let's go to the last section. We have three watts and we have got one left. Um, it's the materials, ladies and gentlemen. The use of materials. There's growing scarcity in raw materials. When we talk nowadays about uh, renewable energy and the circular economy, it's almost always on the level of where are the molecules, the energy molecules, the molecules to make stuff. And uh, Sven, you, you brought a letter with you. And it was in the box of everybody. Why is the letter so special? Yeah, I hope you got it. It's so it's made. Yeah, it's on the letter. It's made from elephant grass. What? Elephant grass. What? Yeah. And um, uh, Miss Cantus. Miss Cantus. That's the Latin name for elephant grass. And it was Marshall von der Peppel who got you actually in touch with the elephant grass, wasn't it? Yeah. And the way he's this. Yeah, Marshall, you were here. You're this wonderful guy who you, who invented like with with your with your team with your people that you could turn elephant grass, like growing stuff into, for example, asphalt. Like, and we started imagining like all the roads in the world, you know, they are heavy, right? And they need to replace every 15 years. If we can store carbon mm -hmm. through elephant grass. You can do lots in of all stuff the roads. You can make paper of it. You can make concrete out of it. You can make packaging out of it. It's a, sort of a wonder material, isn't it? Well, let's ask Marshall. Marshall, how, how fantastic is Miss Contas? Well, I have to say it's very fantastic. Uh, <laughs> thank you for asking. I, 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 <laughs> it's terrible. I gathered two words. So, yes. um, but uh, it, it's really a, a remarkable crop uh, because it, it can be used for, in, uh, for, for many purposes if you do the right things with it. So um, uh, like, like uh, Sven mentioned, you can use it in asphalt, in concrete. And uh, there's actually really not a lack of good ideas. Uh, I would say uh, if, if, if you look at the... Uh, the functionality of a component of a crop. Just look at nature. What does a component do in the crop? And see if we can tra translate it into uh, functionality for a certain product. Yeah, the good stuff is you can grow exactly it what we do. in many places. Uh, uh, lost pieces of land you can use to grow it. Lands that is, isn't used for a, a few years, you can grow it. So you can really integrate it into society. I had exactly. one word picked out, biorefinery. Yeah, that's correct. Um, we all know the oil refineries, which is uh, the, uh, the, the, the negative uh, side of the word. Uh, uh -huh. we, we use biorefineries because uh, uh, like oil refineries, we actually fractionate materials into uh, more functional and more uh, added value components. So we actually take biomass and we fractionate it into uh, yeah, the separate components and we can see where we can use this for uh, uh, industrial raw material. Yeah, I hope you uh, speed up the coming years because this is stuff we really need. Thank you very much. In the near future, we will all drive on sustainable roads with uh, uh, elephant uh, asphalt, and then we uh, come to sustainable buildings. And that is why Sandra Knapp has joined us in the Zoom because she started Holland Houtland a little while ago. And it's not all about wood, but it's... Uh, uh, about sustainable buildings, and she created, together with Climate Cleanup, a tool. Um, 
Let's see first how buildings can store carbon. This decision-making tool for the boardroom is to accelerate the transition towards bio-based construction. With this tool, decision-makers and investors can easily compare the impact of different building materials on all the values we consider as really important nowadays, like CO2 and nitrogen emissions, long-term carbon storage, biodiversity, well-being, and the way of the house. The tool shows these impacts on the sustainable development goals. The problem is that the current building and construction sector with steel and concrete is responsible for 39% of CO2 emissions worldwide. But buildings can also be the solution. Buildings can be regenerative to the environment and human well-being with materials like hemp, straw, flax and wood. So the tool shows how bio-based materials can transform buildings into carbon sinks. The making of a house. With this tool, everybody can compose a house on the basis of seven layers, and it shows directly what the impacts are. We'll start. I will choose for you the piling and the building foundation. Then we choose the walls and insulation the wall cover, the roof, and the roof cover, and voila, the house is built. House A is the house we composed ourselves, and house B is the standard Dutch house. The impact is shown in the impact categories. It's about stored CO2 in the materials and separate the CO2 reduction in the life cycle, nitrogen emissions, biodiversity, and well-being. The results, you composed a climate positive building, which improves health and happiness. Now you positively influence the impact on ecosystems and our climate. The buildings will influence how people feel. Yeah, it's quite remarkable. Paradise starts in the Netherlands. Sandra, thank you for joining. Uh, about this very concrete tool of yours, is it an open tool? Can anybody use it? You have to unmute yourself, then we can actually hear what you're saying. Ha, huh. after you have COVID, some people <laughs> still forget that. <laughs> Much <laughs> better, yeah. That was my uh, nicotorial moment. Yeah, so, no, uh... <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Go ahead. Did you hear my question? Yeah, you asked uh, if everybody can uh, yeah. see what we did. And uh, yeah, everybody can follow what we did. It's open source. Mm -hmm. And where can we find the tool? Or time knows that I'm going to ask later. What, is, what are your expectations? Are people really going to embrace this tool? Or are they, are they going to look at it from a distance and say, oh, this is a scary change? How, how can we <laughs> incorporate it? Um, no, actually, it's not a scary change. Uh, it's for uh, a lot of persons in the boardrooms, uh, very difficult to see um, if they, for instance, want to have energy transition, is, is to see how it, infect, how, how it infects their real uh, decisions. Mm -hmm. So uh, we coupled the decision-making uh, with the real projects. So it will help them a lot to make uh, better decisions on energy transition. Yeah, great. And thank you yeah. so much for that, because it's such a concrete tool. You can actually start right away and compare stuff. Tan, uh, where can we find the tool? And uh, where is Sandra actually located? Uh, oh, my well, God, you need your map again. <laughs> yeah, well, here's the map. And you can see that Holland Houtland is in uh, The Hague. In The Hague, yeah. Lovely The Hague. Mm -hmm. um, and you can find everything uh, that's said, uh, being said tonight. You can find it and the climate action plan, um, which we created for, for all of you to, to, to really take action. But you can also see all the things we discussed in the in the show notes. So you can uh -huh. see, for example, Everything the- is there on the action yeah. page, which is so, good because this is what we want, Sven, action. This uh, Sandra tool, shall we call it that way? Um, how, how- The action tool. Yeah. Uh, how big a difference can it make? Well, we were actually super happy to we teamed up with ASN Bank. Um, and uh, to find that out. And 
um, for the Netherlands, um, in all the new buildings that could be made, you we think about 60 megatons that could be stored. It's just about a third of our yearly emissions. In the Netherlands? Uh, in the Netherlands alone, so some gigatons globally. Yeah. And um, most of all, if you do it right, it's not only that, but it's also you will get more forests and more nature. Because if you build the right, use the right kind of wood, yeah. then... Uh, and in, in, in Europe, for example, this has been sorted out, you know. So if you build a wooden house or bio-based house, you have more forests. Yeah. For it. So when counterintuitive start growing, the wheel starts turning. Right. The problem always is in a new world, all uh, the, the values are new too. And they're mostly measured by tools from the old world. So this is why we need new tools. And the good thing is we uh, have another tool and it's... Uh, Introduced by a very special guest, we are really honored he's here, the National Climate Envoy for the Netherlands, uh, Mr. Marcel Bergeboom, in the Zoom. Marcel, welcome. Uh, you've been the Climate Envoy for the last five years, if I'm correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh -huh. What made you decide to become that? I I'm, I'm don't know whether it was a, was a real decision, but I, I was responsible for food security uh, those days within the Ministry of Development Cooperation mm -hmm. uh, to help poor farmers in developing countries. And what I noticed was that, that climate change was having a severe impact on, the, on those poor farmers. You could basically say that they are in double trouble. They are poor already. And because they are poor, they feel the effects of climate change much more severely than we do in the West. Right. So when the vacancy for climate envoy came by, I decided to apply. And as a civil servant, you took a lot of initiative, which is uh, very good in my opinion. Why are politics and policies so important in systematic changes? What, what can you do from, from your position? Well, if you talk climate change, um, everybody has a task. But I think as a government, you have a specific responsibility. Uh, you have the ability to, um, to reward good behavior and to punish bad behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, governments create the enabling environment. And I think that that's a huge responsibility that, uh, that needs to be taken seriously. And could you do that along the way of all those five years? Or was there a lot of bouldering going on and stuff you wanted but couldn't do? The, the, I actually had, my task has two sides. Uh, on the one hand, I'm uh, representing the Netherlands internationally when we kind of order international agreements. Uh, but I also try to uh, translate what we agree internationally to national action. And, th and that is where what you could call um, civil servant entrepreneurship into play, how to connect those dots and, and how to see where the opportunities are. And that's what I try to do. Yeah, and that's why you fit in with Climate Cleanup so well. We, we, we are connecting dots as well. You've often been working with the financial sector. How can they help the construction sector to change from old-fashioned concrete towards wood and elephant grass? What can you do? You know, listening and looking to all the solutions that have been presented tonight and that will be presented later on, uh, all those solutions have one thing in common, and that is that they need skill. Um, and often that also can be created by um, investing more money. So, so money is, is a very important means to an end. In fact, one of those international agreements that you all know, the Paris Agreement, says in its article 2.1c that we have to align all financial flows with the objectives of the agreement. Um, that is slowly happening, so we need speed as well. And uh, what I try to do is, is indeed help the financial sector doing that, also in the Netherlands. And if you look at the Sandra tool, then if you combine the two, what will come out of it in your perspective? If, if you combine these two? The, the Sandra Carbon Building Woodland Tool. Well, maybe this is then the moment to, um, to, to reveal something new. Yeah, um, please do. Ben spoke about the, uh, the cooperation between climate cleanup and the, uh, the ISN Bank in the mm -hmm. Netherlands. Um, and, and in that cooperation, something new uh, is being created, uh, a metric. And that is something that I find in, in the financial sector is very useful. You actually need to measure what you do uh, to also take the right decisions. Exactly. Uh, 
say that that we we knew we know that the bookkeepers will save the world. Um, <laughs> maybe this tool can help there. That's the uh, construction stored carbon. Yeah, so here it is. Go ahead. Can you say a little bit more what's in it in the metric? Well, yeah, maybe uh, Sven is in a position to uh, to explain that. Oh, I'll, I will. Thank you so much for uh, revealing the tool, Sven. The carbon metric. Well, yeah, I think it's a it's a trim tab. It's a real game changer because uh, you know right now until January of this year. Um, in countries like the Netherlands, we were not permitted to account for carbon stored in buildings, which is kind of crazy seeing the climate crisis mm. because of European norms. So a concrete building would come out about the same as a bio-based building. Um, but once you start to account really for this climate value, then it's a no-brainer. It's better, nicer, more beautiful. So, and, and this is what you saw in the tool, which is which we open sourced. So with us and we thought, uh, if we show this value for financial people, uh, they can understand. And then the rules for mortgages and for project finance, they also will change. They are changing. So that will be yeah. a leverage, a lever really, to from the financial sector, which also is powerful, change this very powerful and incumbent construction sector. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is the reason we we, we co-created this metric as part of ONCRA, like open natural carbon removal accounting. Yeah, and we, we like that. Say ONCRA. 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 ONCRA tool. And, um, will understand it. and we are trim. Super happy that today uh, our climate envoy, envoy uh, yeah. Mr. Marcelo Ökobom, is and I think revealing a lot of this people work. will use it. So fantastic! Dig into it more if you want to learn more about it. For now, Marshall, thank you very much for this announcement. I heard that your envoy ship will end in a few months. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Maybe it's time for you to team up with Clim Climate Cleanup, right? I'll continue continue to do that. Happy to do. Yeah, thanks. Just, just, just hop on board. Mm -hmm. We need an envoy. So. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks very much. The captain and an envoy. And everybody at yeah. home who wants to uh, read more about the uh, metric or all the other stuff, uh, Thijs knows it's the action page, right, Thijs? It's all on the action page. Um, now, more materials. Please uh, take the rocks from your box at home and get your hammers ready because uh, in, in a few moments, uh, we're going to do some real action with it. And our next guest uh, is the last material guest. He's from California, biohacker and futurist, and much more, Eric Metzner. Eric, are you there? Yes, hi. Hi, uh, there. Uh, Tyne, could you please point out where is Eric at the moment? Yes, I can. On uh, the beach. On the beach. On somewhere. the beach. Yeah. <laughs> As usual. <laughs> Sven, how did you meet Eric? Well, um, <laughs> in, in Pennsylvania, we uh, we met, um, and you gave me this. I don't know if you can see this. This, this uh, grain of yeah, olivine in this uh, in this hourglass. Oh, yeah. And actually, it's too large for the hourglass. You told me, so it doesn't it doesn't fall down. It, it freezes work. time. Mm. It freezes time. So the olivine can give or olivine, as you say, give gives us <laughs> extra time really to uh, turn the ship around, to avert catastrophe, and build a, build a beautiful world. Right, yeah. that's what you said. So and this is where we want to go to at the olivine material. Yeah. Eric, uh, you're co-founder of the project Festa. And in our double nature talk a few months ago, you told everything about it, but a few people that are here tonight might have missed that. So let's uh, watch a short video first, shall we? Brian Lay with Project Vesta here. I'm uh, gonna talk to you today about sand. So here we are in the big island of Hawaii at Two Step, a world renowned snorkeling destination. And you'll notice that uh, this is a lava rock beach. Uh, you'll see that there's white sand and um, kind of black lava rock sand. The white sand comes from coral mostly and there's a great reef just uh, feet away and the black sand comes from this lava rock and if you take the lava rock and you look really closely you might start to see tiny glimmers of uh, green or yellow green and oh, there's one right in the center if you can see that. That is olivine, and olivine makes up a huge percentage of these rocks. So uh, most black sand uh, that you're gonna see or lava rock coastline has a ton of olivine. 
And it's evidenced by, with a little time, I found this in about five minutes here, uh, you can find these pieces that have gemstone quality olivine that is unweathered. So most of the olivine weathers pretty, pretty quickly, except for these gemstone pieces that have less surface area. And uh, they'll stick around for a while. So the bright green is kind of unweathered olivine. And over time, it will turn a little bit more yellow or brown, and then eventually um, kind of white, but that is quickly washed away by the ocean. And that's the reaction that we're interested in at Project Vesta, is the olivine reacting with the carbonic acid that is in the ocean and uh, turning CO2 into stone. What is the, the status of your project right now? Where are you at the moment? I'm happy to provide a quick summary of what we do, which Please. is yeah. basically taking olivine rock, or olivine as the Dutch say, <laughs> and uh, mimic this natural beach behind me, which is in Hawaii, essentially placing olivine not just on the coastline, but on the shore, or sorry, in the deeper ocean as well. So wave action breaks it down and it changes the ion chemistry in the ocean to send carbon dioxide into carbonate uh, eventually. Uh -huh. And how much olivine is there in the world? Is it scalable or are we running out of it? Yes, it's a very common mineral, makes up over 50% of the upper mantle and is basically found on every continent and anywhere where we'll need it. Uh -huh. The problem is it's underground. All of it near the surface is essentially already weathered. Right. So if we can acquire some and spread it out, increase the surface area, it dramatically accelerates the weathering rate and the carbon sequestration. Uh huh. And is it uh, easy to dig it up so that we can actually use it? And what will your next steps be the coming, uh, say, five to eight years? Yes, uh, it's fairly easy to acquire. It's inexpensive and each ton of it removes one ton of carbon, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so the plan is to dig up as much as possible and essentially minimize the emissions in that process, mm -hmm. which is fairly low if it's moved only a limited distance, and then deploy projects all over the world to remove gig up to gigaton scales of carbon. Yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, fantastic work, Eric, and for being uh, with us tonight. What, what's the time at, uh, in California right now? Uh, noon, around noon. Oh, yeah, so you're lucky. I thought it was in the middle of the night, but that's the other way around. So next time we yeah. call somebody from Japan or something just to annoy them. <laughs> Thanks very <laughs> yeah. much. And uh, the good thing All is right. uh, we work in the Netherlands with olivine as well, and uh, that uh, uh, climate changing project is... Uh, um, worked out by the company called Green Sand. And from Green Sand is here, Lise Lott and Bosch. Lise Lott, welcome. Hello. Hi. Um, the good thing is, Green Sand sponsored all the rocks in the box for the people at home. Yes, we why, did. Why did you do that? Because we think that we're raising awareness about olivine is very important mm -hmm. because it's such an easy solution. Yeah. Now, I've been uh, in, in green conferences for maybe 15 years now, and it was all always one man chasing me with a little rock in a plastic bag and a little booklet saying, this is the solution. And nobody listened. And how come it finally broke through? I think time is changing as well. I think climate solutions are becoming more aware. And I think they really have an opportunity now. Uh -huh. So this is the time to get olivine out. The good thing is um, I asked everybody at home to get a hammer. And I hope you did. And um, we're going to use that hammer in a minute. What are we going to do? We're gonna, yeah, smack it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the word. That's gonna smack the planet. <laughs> and the good thing is, um, before we try, we actually asked a, a tiny little person who really has a whole life in uh, in front of him to demonstrate how it should be done. And the good thing is, it's Sven's son. Let's watch it. Real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the good thing is he's still got all his front teeth. So this is how it should be done. Maybe we can even do it better. My idea is get up, get outside, take your rock, take your hammer. We're going to do the same thing. Don't do this inside the home because it can really get a bit messy. So uh, 
get prepared and see you in a minute. Let's get outside, guys. Oh, yeah. Ha! Good. Smack it. Yeah! Smack it again. Now you. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Watch my eyes. Yeah! This is smack everything. Wait, 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 wait. 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 This is a little bit next. Next. Damn. You missed. You missed. missed. Again, again. Again. Yeah, that's it. Everything's breaking up. Oh, never mind. You got okay. the idea. The smaller the olivine gets, the more carbon dioxide it takes from the atmosphere. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. I have to say goodbye for now because I have to run to the other side of the country to save the world over there. Ruth is taking over inside. Thank you for watching. See you next time with Climate Cleanup. And remember that new sustainable world we can only make together. Bye-bye. Ruth, the hammer is yours. Thank you. And that's the hammer. Uh, we have to smash the whole things. Um, I was careful. I was I was um, in a short phone call uh, two hours ago with uh, Roger Cox, and he was the lawyer of um, our friends. They are fighting against Shell, and he was talking about a hammer as well. So we need three people with hammers. <laughs> let's do it, and uh, and let's dig. Um, yeah, w welcome, welcome very much. Um, you are um, our uh, chairperson from the beginning. Yeah. We said until there is a better one, so you will be forever. <laughs> no, no, um, no, no, I'm still waiting. <laughs> and we met when you were uh, the Dutch um, uh, Energy Commissioner. Yes. Yeah. National. The, yeah. The national. The national uh, Dutch <laughs> Energy yes, Commissioner. Yes, yes. And yeah. I was to uh, be your secretary. Yeah. Yeah, that's how we. And we're we're we both, still are. Yeah, we're still yeah. are, and it, it's all fake. It is. Yes, yeah, of course. It's 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 but like it Santa Claus. Only Santa Claus is leaving the country uh, every Christmas after Christmas, and we we are staying. Yeah. So it's very important. Yes, uh, the, the energy commissioner, the national commissioner, is. We were thinking about the, all the discussions about climate change and all the things, and we are we are noticed that. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So we were thinking about let's create some someone, some uh, a guy like me, who can can come at the table, and not so that we are not on the menu. So we talk with all the people about the great possibilities we have, and we're still there. And we're still still doing that, yeah. yeah. But it's all fake. But you, if you believe in it, <laughs> it's still here. It sounds like the yeah, future. with a hammer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Linda was there as well. Yeah, and uh, you always came up, uh, Ruud, with all those front runners in clean energy, and we were all always surprised, uh, like, okay, uh, who who is this and who is that, and 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 you keep on doing that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. and that's something uh, that I re that you really t taught me. That there's all there's always more. So you think like, okay, there's a big energy company and they know what to do. No, <laughs> often they don't know what to do. They just stick to their to their old plans. And but there's always more. And who are those people who uh, who do things differently? And how can we get them uh, in in front seat? Yeah, it's it's, it's a never ending story. Uh, it's it's about innovation and. Uh, there are lots of people always creating things, and that will never stop. So it's like love; it's uh, it's it's there's there's enough love, and it's uh, ever ending, and it, it's 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 all it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. So um, and we have we have yeah in the garage, in the small, in the in the streets, uh, normal people are creating, and big companies are implementing things, and they are doing the great things. But we have to bring them together. And we have also listened to the the, the creators. The yeah. Did you follow the news of the social tipping point? Uh, two day, yesterday or two days ago? Time flies. But that's, uh, they were point, pointing also out to uh, uh, use society. Yeah. There's so so many people around who uh, know what to do, who've got new things. Yeah. And that's what you show both in your documentary, Paradise on Earth, which I think is really a brave title. Like if, if, you, if you're, you, can't, you step forward and you say, yeah, 
paradise on earth. Yeah, yeah. because Ruth, why um, did you bring your daughter actually? Uh, I'll answer did that. We really like to be together, first of all. But I think it's a year ago. Uh, I saw him on Dutch television, live Dutch television. Uh, he was talking about the documentary of Michael Moore, Planet of, Planet of the Humans. And he was getting a bit angry. Uh, <laughs> luckily, he didn't have, have the hammer with him. Uh, but he ended the show with uh, saying he was making his own film. So I was watching it like, oh, okay. Oh. Didn't know that. And afterwards, <laughs> I called him and I said, you're making a film. Let's do it together. Because I'm into filming and um, he's into um, making the world better. <laughs> That's a combination. Uh, Rose Kornstra, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Being with us today. Um, you, uh, so you made a film. Yeah. Shall we, uh, can we see something i hope so yeah huh? <laughs> one half hour so we can uh, you can yeah. okay let's sit back <laughs> let's do it <laughs> let's go vroeger hadden we energie uit de bodem de fossiele brandstof en toen hadden we zo'n kaarsbranden en daar stond dan onder wees wijs met de energie want het brandt op dat is de verkeerde vorm van energie dus de energie die we nu niet meer moeten gebruiken. Wij kunnen alles circulair maken op deze aardkloot. We kunnen het rondmaken, we kunnen het hergebruiken. Het enige wat we moeten toevoegen is energie. En die energie komt van buiten. Die komt van buiten de aarde. Met de zon, wind, misschien wel magnetische velden. We zitten op een enorme uh, draaitol die, uh, die mogelijk energie maakt. Dus ik noem het maar de astrofysische energie. Die moeten we gebruiken. En we moeten verder heel erg zorgzaam omgaan met de middelen die wij hier op deze aardloot hebben. Dus niet het verbranden van spullen, maar het gebruiken van energie. En die energie gebruiken om vervolgens alle materialen, alles wat we hebben, het in een circulaire kringloop te brengen. We hebben het over de energietransitie. Maar de energietransitie kan je niet loszien van het economisch systeem. Dus als wij alleen maar fossiele energie vervangen door duurzame energie, in hetzelfde economisch systeem, schieten we dus niet op. Want ons economisch systeem is gebaseerd op rendement. Korte termijn groei. Dat zit ook in ons. Een deel van ons is egoïstisch. Is greedy. Dus die systeemtransitie zit voor een deel in onszelf. Dus als wij zeggen... we gaan alleen maar de ene technologie vervangen door de andere... maar we blijven egoïstisch, we blijven gericht op korte termijn groei... dan schieten we geen centimeter op. En de kern is dat dus de buitenstaande altijd de vernieuwing binnenbrengt. Dat is de grote wetmatigheid. In de hele geschiedenis is dat zo geweest. Als je de 500 topdenkers van de laatste duizend jaar uitzoekt... Van Galileo tot Einstein tot uh, Lorenz, onze eigen Lorenz, dan zijn dat buitenstaanders geweest. En dan kunnen we dus met elkaar, met veel meer mensen, uh, in balans met deze aarde leven. Dus die energietransitie is van cruciaal belang voor heel veel andere zaken. Voor zaken op het gebied van biodiversiteit, op het gebied van armoede, van water. Dat zijn allemaal dingen waar je energie voor nodig hebt en die wordt nagenoeg gratis. Oh ja. Yeah. Ja, dus paradijs en gratis energie. Free energy. Ja, yeah, free energy. Oh, sorry. Ja, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because, yeah. because the, the, it, it's all on our planet right now. And the only thing we need is energy from outside. So it's, it's, it's there. It's the, yeah, from, from, from the sky. And uh, I think the sun is the most important one, but we also have all kind of other energy available um and we, we yeah we can uh, we can source the energy and it, i think it's it's almost for free it's om, it, it, it's already almost for free energy it's 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 one cent per kilowatt hour mm. uh in spain already it's four cents on the on the sea right now with wind energy so it's 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 available and we can make a lot of it And much better than than we do it right now. And then we have to share it, and so and and yeah, we have to store it. 
and that's the, that's the next uh, 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 important thing. And there are great ideas in the film as well uh, with with energy storage. So you, yeah. you were for for over a year. You, when you were seeing the clip, you were both like uh, saying the same things, uh, like verbatim uh, 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 saying the words that were being said in the film together. A unison. How was it for you, Rose, to work with your father? Actually, <laughs> <laughs> it was really fun. I think we make a really good team, but uh, we are also very different because he already has the knowledge uh, and he gets really energized uh, uh, over this subject. And I was there sitting. Uh, I know, yeah, to be honest, I didn't know that much. So uh, it was very important for me to. Uh, ask the questions when I didn't know something or uh, uh, didn't get it or because in the end I'm the generation who needs to uh, understand what they're saying because he's in this in this industry for how long 20 years yeah sort of yeah and 25, I'm, yeah. I'm 26 and I I, I, always, I I always heard his stories but I never saw it myself Yeah, and she was also, because there were some things that I was listening to and because people were saying, why are we don't do the things we already can do? Because it's already there. And and all the people were talking about, yes, yes, that's, that's, uh, that's politics. And then she asked me, ask more, why, why? And then they talk about the invisible hand and all kinds of things. And and I think uh, yeah, um, for me it's 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 so normal, to, and and it's such a, a it's it's already there, but it's not out there. It's it's still in the garage. It's still in small things. And and yeah, I think we have some great things uh, discovered. Some great things in the movie, and you can see it if you like to. When we, can we see the film? How can we see it? It's it's already there. It's uh, yeah. We have to wait. Uh, I think another five days for the subtitles in English and also uh, I think in 20 other uh, uh, languages but it's 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 the uh, Dutch version is already on YouTube that was the, yeah right. that was the, yeah the, the, the that's question paradise. was and that was the end yes. yeah. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. on YouTube for free. Aarde, yeah. but the the, yeah. the English ver version, version will come. yeah great and time will we show it on the action page yes of course it's visible at the action page and there you can find the full version on uh, oh. YouTube So for all members and viewers. Yeah. And for the for the English uh, thing, wait uh, a few days because it's uh, it's available in on Sunday. Super. Um, <laughs> so uh, you say that SDG 7 energy free for all uh, yeah. helps all others. How so? How does it work? How does it stop hunger and thirst? And um, yeah, I, I'm uh, so I'm the, the, the energy commissioner. That's fake, but I'm the real coordinator of SDG 7, and that's uh, affordable green energy for everyone in 2030. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I discovered that uh, with all my colleagues from the other SDGs, mm -hmm. um, that the energy transition is a very important one. And if we can, if we can do the energy transition, we can do a lot of other things. So I was important again uh, in the, in the in the whole discussion and uh, it's it's and it, it's doable so if we can do the energy transition we can do all the other things as well and i'm an entrepreneur i my big dream in 2000 2001 was paradise on earth for all the people uh, in 2030 hmm. inspired by uh, the president of the united states with the man on the moon in 10 years so at 30 years and Not on the moon, but <laughs> but on Earth. So it, and and all the people were laughing, and you're crazy, and I'm crazy. But and in the at the end, in 2015, it became the paradise on Earth, the SDGs. It was a UN resolution with uh, a signed by 193 countries. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was not a dream anymore. It was still my dream, but it was it was an agreement. So now we have to work the other 10 years to make it happen. And I think that's that's doable. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, there are a couple of members who already uh, who have already seen the movie. So for example, uh, Anno Drent, great, and uh, Jelisa Kaarsenhout also. Jelisa was also uh, at the National Energy Commission. So great you're here Jelisa as well. Very yeah. nice film. Yeah. Yeah. And is Reiner with us? 
Reinert, ja. Ja, Reinert. Yes, I'm there. I'm there. Yeah, I'm there. there's Reinert. Now, Reinert is, is one of the, I think, one of the, the yeah, I think, uh, soldiers. He's working uh, for, in the province of uh, Gelderland. And, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and one of our most faithful members. Yes, of not course. And, uh, I think you uh, missed how, one Double Nature talk. Yes, of all the 40, I missed one, I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shame. Shame. Yeah, yeah. Wednesday evening, <laughs> I'm uh, tuning in, and I'm very much, uh, I like this song or the, the, the int uh, entrance in this uh, um, uh, meetings. Yeah, if, if, if one or 30 seconds about what is what are the double nature talks, if you don't know. So all members of Climate Cleanup are always invited Wednesday evenings. We're also Wednesday evening now uh, to uh, come around climate solutions, natural climate solutions. And uh, one of our members uh, gives a presentation and, uh, and the rest is listening, helping out, uh, connecting dots, et cetera, et cetera. And to get, together we build up a huge database of knowledge and people, and we put films on YouTube, etc. So this is sort of a double nature talk, extra large, this masterclass. But next week, uh, we will be in our homes again, eh? uh, Sven? I hope we can be talk. in the studio again. It's much, much better. <laughs> um, also, and because... You get, yeah. you get really inspired. Actually, after the break, <laughs> we always take a beer. So I've taken my beer again. Uh, but it, it really inspires you. I'm actually the only uh, civil servant, I think, mostly in the room. And uh, they also challenged me because the, uh, the, the government is sometimes the cause of problems. So we have to see how we get in dialogue. And I, I like this dialogue, which we have every Wednesday. It's for me very inspiring also how to work with all kinds of new inventions and people who are very motivated to change things in the world and how we can we have to still learn a lot as a as a government how to work together and to get these things done yeah and we have in the studio uh with us uh our dear colleague roy straver roy um and i'll never forget uh first time i kept you waiting for uh, an hour like two days much longer even um and you were the most calm and pleasant mood and it turned out uh you were you are a hands-on strategic thinker and also um, a thatcher, right? Yeah, which is, uh, you make straw roofs. Um, and then uh, I think, Reindert, you met with Roy. No, something else happened. Um, yeah. What happened? I think it was in Pennsylvania at the first International Drawdown Conference where Reindert was giving a poster presentation about Drawdown in Gelderland. I hope the poster is there. Somebody can show it or you have to share my screen. No, I, I hope uh, you have the poster. Anyway. Slide 15, uh, I, I, I think. Slide 15. It is. Yeah. Okay. We, is we, it? We was, oh, yes. Yeah, I, I see it. Uh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Yeah. So I will tell something. Uh, I see Paul Hawken here also. Uh, he will come later in the, in the, but he's with me in the speaker room. And it was very, very much attached uh, uh, or uh, by this um, uh, book of uh, Paul Hawken, or he has composed it uh, uh, on drawdown. And what I thought at that time, I was actually manager in uh, transport and traffic. I thought we have to scale all these ideas. So I we asked the young uh, students to uh, to try to scale up two of the ideas which were mentioned in the drawdown book because the scaling is, I think, the most important thing what we had to do. So that was the first time I actually had to present these uh, things we have done with the students, with bright students. And uh, that's that worked out very well. So that is this poster, what you see there on uh, with the first experience we had with a drawdown scaling challenge. And we could actually present it. And there's where I met uh, Roy. Maybe we can get a second slide. Then I can tell a little bit more because we were so inspired, actually, that we, as Gelderland, it's a region in the Netherlands, it's a province, that we uh, got inspired, actually, by Drawdown to see what we can do in our climate action plans. We got inspired not only by uh, the Drawdown, but we also got inspired, actually, by Urgenda. Urgenda was also one of the Dutch NGOs who also won a case uh, on climate uh, two years ago, which was a very much... A 
term uh, point or an, an, an also like a drawdown point, but, but more a tipping point, you can say, for us to work as a government, we had to do more. So we used also all the suggestions which uh, Urgenda has uh, made. They are 54 actually in the book of uh, Paul Horken uh, in the drawdown. It's about 100 and it's 100 plus now. So we have used that as an inspiration as government and to see how we can use those. So that's our, and then I get them. Next slide, actually, and then I will show. So for us, actually, what we do in the Calland Climate Action Plan, eh, it's for the coming 10 years, we try to have a very much, we focus on a dialogue with the citizens. We will, every two years, we will update the process uh, and, and update our uh, Climate Action Plan. And the plan is very interconnected with all kinds of ambitions, also on biodiversity, which I think is very, very important. And we also look very much to the SDGs as a kind of monitoring tool. And the third thing, and then I uh, finish this, maybe the slide can be, because it will give some idea also for Roy. Uh, we got now, actually, we what we do is uh, monitoring modeling, and we got assistance of the drawdown Europe. So what we have done, actually, and that's, that's quite special, we have regionalized uh, the drawdown methods. That's only done now in, in two parts of the world. One is in Georgia and the USA, and the other one is in our province. So we are very, very uh, proud of it that we have used this. So I want to, uh, that's actually, actually, I want to see, and Roy can explain more about it. But, but if you listen to uh, Reinhardt, you're a real uh, civil servant. Uh, it's I think uh, I think you're you're the presentation of all the people from the government. They have to listen to you, and uh, maybe you can inspire them as well. It's I try. I thank you for the compliment. Uh, we, we, we really are a civil servant, for, so we are working for the. Uh, civil also for the society. That's where we are for. It's not only for uh, the ministers and the, uh, no, that no. we are working both. And, so and tell your you. colleagues about uh, about your job. <laughs> I, I will do. I will do. Thank you. Hey, Roy, you you are uh, the director of DERA, actually. What? what what's, what's DERA? DERA is the synonym for the Trotten Europe Research <laughs> okay. Association. Okay. <laughs> so for whom who don't know Project Drawdown, Project Drawdown was found as a global research initiative to the question how and when we can reverse global warming. And after we translated the book to Dutch about three years ago, we got the question more and more about what can we now actually do in our local context. And then we found Drawdown Europe as a research association to help guide local communities and provinces like uh, Reindert with the question how they can maneuver towards the moment of drawdown, towards reversing global warming and towards regeneration. Fantastic. And now uh, we can see your plan. Um, yeah, we, um, we just only started with um, guiding Gelderland in this process. And we prepared a couple of slides as well because Gelderland already had a lot of insights into their carbon landscape. And then they asked us to help them, guide them getting more insights in their non-energy related carbon landscape, like methane uh, and all the other not carbon greenhouse gases. Yeah. So we made a first um, overview of what all the gases were, all the sources of greenhouse gases in Gelderland. Um, if you look to the uh, to the overview we made on the next slide, you see the land use sectors, the mobility sectors. And if you zoom further in for just one example, you see that landfilling is actually quite a big source of the Gelderland area. If you zoom in further, mm -hmm. then you see that only landfilling is I think responsible for more than 60% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions of the industry sector in Gelderland on the non-energy related emissions. 60%. More than 60%. Yeah. And what we then did is mapping all the potential pathways to either reduce, replace, or e even biosequester greenhouse gases in the context of landfilling industry in this 
example, we did the same for Yonder Industries, which gave a little interactive um, yeah, website where you can play with putting solutions on and off and see what it does. So just as a you, starting point. Then you uh, get the picture. Then you can see what's the best things to do. Exactly. It's not it's not somewhere there. It's it's about facts and figures. You can see that in the next 10 years, we can actually get quite far with getting to net zero and starting the process of reversing. And this is only the start, of course, because we only modeled carbon, but it's about creating better lives. And for that, there are things coming in that are way too complex to model, but we can at least give a sense of where this province can go. And by this, we are uh, starting to help a province, but we hope that we can interconnect way more parts of Europe to give a sense of what they can do. That's great. Great. Yeah. And, and um, with the Reindert also, will you uh, offset and, and make net zero targets for Gelderland? No way. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds strange maybe, but for me, it's very, very important that you actually set two separate targets. One target on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and one on sequestration. If you don't, if you put that together, it makes not so much sense. It, 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 it troubles everything. So please, please, I hope really that in COP26, they will separate these two targets. So one target is on sequestration. What we talked about actually uh, before, it's sequestration is actually taking CO2 into uh, trees or into uh, olivine and those kind of things. And the other one is just to reduce the emissions. And you have to do both because if you do both, you also have to protect uh, or even enlarge your woods because you have to get more sequestration. So I hope really that both in the Green Deal of Europe as well as in the uh, COP uh, in, in those negotiations, that there will be two separate targets. So that's yeah. for me very, very important. I'm always <laughs> tweeting for that. So uh, I try to get it done. Great, yeah. and we totally agree. Um, right, uh, one last question. Um, it's uh, this, this presentation uh, Roy talks about is like a dashboard, but I know you're working on a dashboard for all the SDGs in uh, Gelderland. And I, I'm a little bit involved and you call it the mission control. Uh, of yes. we, we can, can you, can you tell a little bit about that project as well? Yeah, I will uh, tell it because it's a little bit like uh, this, this thought of going to the moon and the moon shots. We have now the earth shots uh, to get to the earth. And what we try is to really see like emission control they had in Houston to see what is happening. And what we will make is that you have missions. Let's say we we plant a lot of trees, eh? one million in, in uh, Gelderland, or we make this house, what we just saw uh, from Sandra, we made them more with wood, and then we can calculate how much impact that has. And we will get uh, children, everyone to get to this room where there's a lot of screens and you can just see what is happening. And I think that will actually uh, make it more visible. And we do that for all the SDGs, not only for uh, climate. We also look at biodiversity and other things. So we try to combine, as it is also in the film 2040, to see both so that you can see what impact our missions have on the SDGs and also have on climate. And, and, I, and we make, hope that this yes. will work. And this, it, 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 for, we, we do it now also. We need actually all these things that we do was draw down to show it because we have to calculate things. Yeah, mm -hmm. and make the right decisions. So you have the dashboard, your cockpit available for the next uh, 10 years. Yeah, I was a soldier before, actually an officer. So I really like that to be uh, again in the lead and to, to, to see what happens when you change things. So we try that. It's not for me or we are as a civil servant, you're not totally in the lead, but you can try to guide a little bit. Yes, mm. and do it bottom up and not top down. I think that's uh, That's the thing what we, we said. Yes. And first thing what we do is in dialogue with uh, all the citizens. That's, I think, the most important thing that we get a lot of people uh, to work with us. Thank you. Great. So we're not going to offsetting. Um, maybe we will go to onsetting. For us, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Reindert, first, and uh, and Roy for joining us. Um, for us, this, this offsetting feels still like indulgence, and we're we're really searching uh, uh, and working on and pondering this problem in uh, within Ankara. 
uh, because there's been so many problems, right? The 85% of, of offsets in the in the like past 20 years turned out to be rubbish, non-additional. So um, as we're working out uh, alternatives, we're also doing uh, market research. And for this, uh, to look at the buyers and the markets, and we have, uh, that is we, Hanni van Hout, our great ops director, asked a group of students at the Tesla minor um, uh, at the University of Amsterdam to test the markets, so to say. So to really think with us, like, what, what do we make from that? Uh, so a warm welcome to Luna Watel, uh, Anne Filet, and Nicole Terpstra for joining. Are you with Hi. us? I am, I am. Great, how are you? Uh, I'm good. Um, what have you been up to? Oh, yeah. yeah. We have been doing, um, yeah, well, our market research. Uh, and I think we have some slides for that. Uh, yes, that there looks great. Um, so I'll just tell a little bit about who we are. Uh, so um, we are students, as Sven said, from the University of Amsterdam, and we're doing the uh, Tesla minor. And there's three of us, uh, and Nicole is uh, will be speaking after me, and Anna cannot be here, uh, sadly. Uh, and um, in the next slide, you can see our backgrounds. Um, Nicole and I have a background in neuroscience, and Anna has a background in ecology. Um, and uh, in this Tesla minor, we try to gap the bridge between uh, uh, science, society, um, and uh, business. Uh, so that's why we had this project, and we're very excited about it, and we're still doing the project. Um, and um, well, in the next slide, there's just a picture of who is doing the Tesla Miner. Uh, where there's 20 students of us with different uh, projects. Um, and uh, Nicole will now tell you a little bit more about our project. Uh, let me see. I think this is working, right? So um, next slide, please, Linda. Then I can tell you a little bit more about what we're doing. So um, as Luna already said, we have been going at this project for approximately two and a half months now. So first of all, of course, we started with understanding the problem. So what is going on on the carbon offsetting marketplace and how can we make it more that onsetting becomes more important actually. So we wrote the proposal about that and our proposal focused on doing this market research. So for our market research, of course, we needed potential buyers to interview. So we made a selection that was as broad as possible. So we wanted to interview not only for example, people in the food industry and the transport industry, but also people working at public entities or at, for example, a university. Um, right now we're in the phase of the data collection. So we have been interviewing with a lot of these people and their responses have been really enthusiastic. They like the idea of this carbon removal, so capture and storage. They like other ideas as well, but maybe more on that later after we have finished our project and the next phase will be that we do a survey based on these interviews really to get a quantitative feel on the data and we want to do a literature search in order to get ultimately get a lexicon of the words that are commonly used in the field and which we can help to create a communication tool which can in an effective and interesting way show what ONCRA this accounting platform is really all about and ultimately we want to create this platform of course to help fund these amazing entre entrepreneurs that have have been talking to us in this uh, lovely festive masterclass. so for example the CUE company the guys working on olivine and so in the next slide you can see our uh, gmail actually so if you have any questions or tips or if you want to stay up to date with our project you can email us at this teslaminer.cc at gmail.com because we really believe that creating Ankara and making it to a success on the market is the an important step and maybe the next step in restoring this carbon balance. So it's it's not <laughs> end, it starts now. So uh let's respond on the on your project. 
Thank you very much. Thanks for joining. Um, our next guest is um, also, you imagine the future, you do very rigid research and then you start imagining. And for that phase, our next guest is um, a director at our office. So the, um, our house bass, uh, <laughs> a landlord, <laughs> not really, director of um, Tolhuis Town, which is a good, well, you will explain yourself, Matea de Jong, please. Yeah, please join and maybe switch place with Roy. Um, for now, um, because for us, you really are uh, a role model, actually. Oh, <laughs> yeah, combining the imagination, really, in art and design, uh, into a place and in people, people meeting, and then also in in like being a role model in in making decisions in your own life, work on these issues. So um, thank you, Sven. It is nice to have you guys in uh, the Tollhuistuin. Uh, yeah. It's and actually, office. the Tollhuistuin is an old shell building. It is. So it is the heart of the fossil fuel. Yeah, so it's, it was it's, the heart of the fossil it's fuel. It's rethink all. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was great. also inspired by that history to yeah, take on yeah. the job. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, talking about role models, um, you asked me to tell to share something. And um, I was um, thinking about Wangari Matai. I don't know if you know her. She's a lovely, beautiful Kenyan woman. And I met her in 2009 when she was a guest at the festival I organized at that time, Movies That Matter. And uh, she made a huge impression on me um, because, um, let me tell you a little bit of her story. It was in 1977 when she started to plant trees. She is from Kenya um, came back from America, found the, count the country and saw that industrial um, 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 techniques, farming techniques really destroyed the land. So she um, started to plant trees. First, she went to the landowners, but they were not interested to work with her. And then she went to the women, mainly marginalized women. And she asked them, please join me on this movement. And they did. And that was the start of the Green Belt movement. Thousands and thousands of women started to plant trees. And what is interesting about her story, it is um, uh, that it's not only about planting trees and eco um, restoration, but also about fighting poverty, yes. building a community. Uh, in her own words, she said, it's more than planting of trees. It's the planting of ideas. It's giving people a reason why they should stand up for their rights. And I wanted to show you a short clip. It is of poor quality, but I think her personality makes up for it. And I think it's a very lovely clip. So do we have the clip? Over Mithia to a hard and limited to the limit of the Kaburi to the limit to Gartigra, Shanashito, or the Navy to Atigil and Mighty Mighty. Little who would to take a Kohaga, Hagaki or Nadu. I don't know Kuraga Maragata with Sidia, and Nikimagasia to the Tobege, the Kyoto, dear Canada, and the Mamma with your royal wife. No more do a man yet. On a Shiva come out or a Mogabana sheep. Oh, I get you. The serpents and the dove. Uh, it was not an easy journey. Uh, in a male-dominated society, she faced arrests, oppositions, detention, um, a coma even. But with her story, she told me how environmentalism is connected with uh, feminism, is connected with anti-colonialism, is connected with anti-corruption. And um, they are all part of the same story. And that's something that we need to realize. It's not separate from each other. Um, well, we need to learn from her and from so many other warriors to be courageous and dare to imagine what a different world can look like, like how she dreamt of Kenya with a green belt of forest. And she did it. She actually literally doubled nature. And um, in 2004, she was the very first African woman to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. So 
really impressive. Uh, years later, it was 2018, um, I organized the Artistic Climate Summit. I think it was the very first time that so many artists came together uh, for an event on the ecological uh, crisis and the climate crisis. It was in Leeuwarden uh, as part of the um, uh, European Co Capital of Culture. And during that event, um, we wrote a letter. And we wrote a letter with all the artists to our government. It was actually to Ed Naples, um, because he was working on all these climate tables. And let me read a fragment of the letter. Um, right now, the effects of climate change are already occurring faster, stranger, harder, and more devastating than scientists predicted. Expectations are surreal, yet they are real. We are heading for warming of four degrees if we continue to live the way we live, if we continue to do politics as we do politics, if we continue to organize ourselves the way we organize ourselves, and if we continue to make art the way we make art. You should see us as the climate table, the table, the missing climate table, the table, table of imagination, reflection, and communication. And only when I read this letter out loud to at Naples, um, only then it really struck me. And I don't know, maybe you recognize it, but I think a lot of people working in this movement have the oh my God moment. And that was for me the oh my God moment. I read a lot about this issue already, but only when I said these words out loud, it really struck me. And I, I felt I should do something about it. I should do more than I did so far. What was his re reaction? Also? Oh, he just took the paper and left. <laughs> it's another story. I'll tell you later. <laughs> And uh, it was the same week as the UN report came out that these coming 12 years are the most important years of our history. Um, and I made a pledge. I looked in the mirror the next day and I made a pledge and I thought, okay, the next 12 years, the coming 12 years, I will dedicate my work um, to this particular issue. I should work on this um, uh, on this topic. So I went to all these climate events, all the talks, all the discussions, and everywhere I went, people talked about money and they talked about technique. And there were a lot of men. <laughs> and I thought, old, okay, old, old white, old, fat, old yeah. white man, yeah. the story. <laughs> <laughs> but the questions that we face are not only white men's interests, they are not only dealing with money and with technique, they're dealing with different set of questions, they're dealing with the menu. And who has a seat on the table? Yes. Um, whose voice is heard? Uh, who's been taken care of? Uh, questions about justice and about injustice, about human rights, the world, the, where, where I worked for a long time. The question, how shall we live together in a warming world? Uh, questions for all of us. So I realized also more than half of all carbon emissions uh, were emitted in the last 30, 40 years, yes. exactly my lifetime. Uh, well, I was just having a good time. And now, in the next 30 years, we need to get emissions down to zero. Technically, it's possible. Um, and also having a good time. And also having a good time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, of course, an Indian writer said it is, uh, it is technically possible, but it is, it's a crisis of the imagination. Yes. And this is where arts and culture step in. And that happens to be my job. <laughs> So we started Warming Up, a platform for arts and culture and climate in the Netherlands with lots of media productions we were on last year. Like, yeah, we started it uh, late 2018, uh, worked on festivals in Rotterdam, Leeuwarden, Amsterdam, also in Toastown. And because we understood the importance of arts and culture as a catalyst for change, for social change, and we wanted to have more people involved, people from different kinds of backgrounds, not only the white men, <laughs> and also amplify the citizen voice. Um, because we can't, solve, we can't solve the climate crisis with reports, financial schedules, technical stuff. Uh, we need to touch people in the heart, um, like Wangari Matai did with her empowering stories. But also like Greta Thunberg when she hissed, um, how dare you? Uh, like the project on the images that we're now about to see. <laughs> I yes, have to so. give a cue to the technicians. <laughs> uh, during the presentation, I uh, did a selection of a couple of images of projects that I worked on, but also a project that I find really inspiring. We need to, to be able to imagine a different world, a 1% world. You have to see it to be it. 
We need new music, new images, new stories, new arts. And I also realized it is not necessarily a bad thing. When we grew up, our generation, we learned to live our dream, explore ourselves, get to travel, uh, pick a study you like, get a nice job, live a happy life. But now the paradigm has shifted. It's obvious what we need to do. We can sit down and more than think we are so unlucky, but it is not necessarily a bad thing to be among the generation that can reinvent, redesign, and rebuild a country, a world, where we have to make things better. We know what to do, and we all need to do it. I really believe it. So not much later, I started to work for, as a director for Tol Einstein. And as you said, it is the former research lab of Shell. That was one of the reasons why I thought, hmm, <laughs> this might be an interesting place to work on the mission. And uh, the beating heart of the fossil fuel industry. And now we can use this beautiful cultural venue so centrally located in Amsterdam with concert halls, gardens, offices, workspaces as a lab for the future. Uh, Shell used to work on, on gasoline, on asphalt, on kerosene, on chemicals, on cracked gas and all that stuff. But now we can work with mycelium, sargassum, olefine, all the things we've seen this night, with music, with images, with community building, the new forms of democracy, a citizen assembly. Here we can show what change can be like. I follow the footsteps of Wangari Matai and imagine a different world. And um, you also asked me, can you bring something that we can from, from the art, from the culture? So I brought the song. It's from Nienke Laverman. Maybe we can listen to a small, like we don't have to listen to the whole song, but just just for like as a break. You're in charge. I yeah. think <laughs> let's listen to it. <laughs> it's called Tree Tree. It's from a beautiful new album that is releases in um, Tree. In Tree, what do you think of me, tree? Tree, what do you see when you look at me? Tree, tree, what do you think of me, tree? Tree, what do you see when you look at me? Do I amuse you? Do I confuse you? Running around and around like I'm used to. Fast forward movie played at your feet. At repeat, at repeat, at repeat. Tree. Yeah imagining paradise and um and how can we create it i think um let's join all the people and all the creators because um it's the dreamer the big dreamers and stop stop not dreaming but dream big so imagine dream your your biggest dream and and realize it and realize it but bigger so if you if you if you can dream about paradise on earth in about 10 years, then we realize it because then it's there. It's our moonshot, but it's 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 already here. So welcome. Thank you. Again. We are very happy, uh, Janneke and Maurits, that you uh, found your way to our studio. Yeah. Janneke Leenaars and Maurits Groen. And... You're back, Janneke, because you were with us last uh, year, as you, Maurits. So yep. what's the news? <laughs> what's the news? Well, it's in the box. Yeah. And indeed, this is uh, something really exciting, because what you have here in the box is uh, one of our first carbon negative carpet tiles. And Wait. this is uh, a big thing, because, um, I mean, this means that the creation of this product did not add to any CO2 in the atmosphere, but actually helped to remove a bit. So the, it's on the, the, the focus is cradle to gate. And I mean, this is, this is, this is huge. 
because we, uh, I think it's nice. You saw already a little pre preview in the pre previous uh, session. This is, uh, you can see how we worked from, uh, from the 90s onwards to where we are now. We launched this carbon negative carbon tile in, uh, in March this year. You see the reductions, the fierce reductions from uh, from from the 90s towards what we what, what we did now, and well, we go beyond neutral, and it's it's all due to uh, technical material, technical innovation. So that's that's really exciting. Yeah. So, so we are holding actually a piece of. So you're a very specific right? it's a gate. So it's a factory gate, right? Yes. So you make it from you grow it or you you. Yeah. And then you make it and then. If you look from that perspective, then this is actually storing carbon yeah, from well, the atmosphere. Yeah, I think so, it's it's good to, to 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 realize that to create a product, yeah, you have indeed uh, raw materials, transport to the factory, the production process, and on that scope, it did not add to CO two emissions, but it's it's it removed a bit, a tiny bit. At, yes, and I the think start. it's a big start because, you know, uh, over the full life cycle, it's not possible yet. But this is an amazing step if you see where we have come from and, and, and also compared to, I think, good to realize that, you know, products have a CO2 impact. And now it didn't add the creation of it yeah. to, to see it. I, I think uh, we need to put something on it. We ask you to, yeah. uh, to make tiny uh, tiles so we can use it as a coaster. Yeah. So everyone has it, all the members have it, and you can put uh, your drink on it. And so uh, I'm going to get some drinks for us now. Yeah, yeah well, so that's good. Tiles. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a couple of more slides yeah, uh, well, for you. Yeah, well, it looks good. Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to the next one. I think, you know, I, I mentioned uh, it's all due to... Tech, material technical innovations and the key one is basic in the uh, new biocomposite backing innovation uh, for this carbon negative carpetal we have the sequence bioex it has a high co higher concentration Thank of you. carbon negative materials and yeah, that in combination with <laughs> material efficiency yeah it duurt alleen al een beetje lang special tough process uh, it results in that carbon negative carpetal cradle to gate and because we take responsibility for the uh, emissions, C2 emissions after our gates, over the full life cycle, the product is carbon neutral in our carbon neutral flooring program, just like all of our products, carbon tile, rubber, LPT. So, and perhaps best to start this whole major thing is it's all part of our climate take back mission, uh, our mission to reverse global warming. And we have the goal year 2040, to become regenerative and to be a carbon negative enterprise. So this is a big and important stepping stone in this. I would call it carbon positive. Yes, I, absolutely. It's a climate positive. The negativity. Uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, but this is a big, big stepping stone in our journey uh, and uh, a lot will follow, but uh, we are very proud of it. Yeah. Great. And it all started with a story, didn't it? Yes, it did. Yeah, Maurits. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I like movies, and I know you like movies. Yeah, and um, and um, you brought some of the most uh, famous. Uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, starting movies about uh, climate change with uh, Al Gore. Al Gore, the inconvenient truth. The inconvenient yeah. truth. I think that's twenty. That no, was, that's eighteen that was years ago. Friday, the sixth of October. 2006. Yeah, and it was a there was a scary yeah. movie, I think. But now there's yeah. a new one. Yeah, and and this movie is about interface. is about uh, the founder uh, uh, Ray, Ray Anderson. Anderson. Ray Anderson. Yeah. And and it hits you because it's positive. It hits you right in the heart. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Can you tell us something about it? Yeah, I, I've seen it um, a month ago and I was really moved to tears. And that doesn't happen often, as my, uh, my wife can tell you. Um, why? It started with a, the whole story uh, with Interface and Ray Anderson started with a book, The Ecology of Commerce, by Paul Hawken, who is a sustainability hero since the 70s. He's written a lot of books that were very influential, but this one was so in particular. 
because Ray Anderson, who had built a company, a multi-billion company in the, in the United States over the period of uh, a quarter of a century, was very profitable. He read that book by chance, and he's an intelligent, conscious guy with, uh, cur with, with courage. So he read that, and he was really shocked by it, because uh, spe spe specifically, I'm sorry, uh, a story in the book, it's about St. George's Island. Um, in the Second World War, there was an island very remote in the Bering Sea, uh, where the Coast Guard had a, had a post. And it was so remote that the supply of food to that island was, was very difficult. And sometimes even the boats couldn't get there. The weather was too rough. The sea was too high. So in order to, uh, so to secure their supply of food, they had some reindeer imported. There weren't reindeer before, but there was abundant trees, um, bushes, uh, grass, abundant food for them. So they survived sometimes by shooting one of those when they didn't have any food whatsoever. After the Second World War, they left again. And one of these guys returned after some 12 years. And when they left after the Second World War, there were 29 reindeer left. After 12 years, there were about 1,500 on very the small healthy, island. Very, very strong, very, very thriving. And so he was very cu curious. And six years later, 18 years after the Second World War, he came again, 6,000 reindeer. But the condition was not that good. So he was very curious what was happening afterwards. Three years after, the 6,000 6, reindeer had dropped to a, a mere dramatic 42. What had happened? They'd eaten everything on the island. They overshoot, and then they collapsed. And that struck Ray Anderson so much. He says, when this is what's going to happen to the earth, because we're plundering the earth, we will face the same fate. We will overshoot, we will collapse. So he said to himself, and he repeated that in the, um, in the shareholders meeting that was quite, quite uh, shortly afterwards. He said, um, someday what I do, what we do, will not be allowed by people anymore. Sometime, maybe not too far in the future, we will be put in jail. For, for a very successful guy. To tell that to his shareholders was such a, such a courageous thing because, I mean, um, the carpet that, that he was producing was 100% made of oil. And he said, we have to get rid of oil. It's like a baker that has to make bread without flour. How, can, how on earth are you going to do that? He didn't know. So he assembled a green eco dream team, the, the very best from the world. They, get the, they got together and says, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we have to, so invent something. That's 25 years ago. And look how far they've come. That's and the story of Beyond Zero of this film, which is so moving to me, is a company that is 100% fossil is able to get rid of it and to have a positive impact instead of a very strong neg negative impact. So if that company is able to do that with dedication and courage and really putting your mind to that, whatever company can say they can't do it. So and we can, we have to, so we will. And a few hours ago, the judge yeah. just said to a big oil company yeah. with the colors of Kodak, the same colors, yeah. So you can choose now. I was, I was really, I was shaking on my, my yeah. I, I was seeing it live when it happened. Yeah, the verdict. I was sitting on my chair. I couldn't. I just couldn't believe it. I was also there at the, the Urgenda cases, all three of them, I, all sessions I, I attended from from start to finish. 
The first one was unbelievable. The second was was outrageous. And the third, the high court, you just didn't know what happened. But this was a company, not a, not, not a government, a company that do, does everything abiding by the rules, so to say. Not in that. So Ray was right else, 25 but, years ago. Yeah. The next step is you, you're going, the yeah. jail is the next step. Yeah. Too I big think, to jail. I think that, that, <clears throat> that might happen. So um, yeah. I don't want to put anyone in jail, but let's join forces. We mm. we also we need all hands on deck. Yeah. Also the people from Shell. Yeah. They have a lot of knowledge, capital, expertise, network, whatever. We cannot afford not to include them. So I certainly hope that they will work together, that it's a wake-up call for them and that they turn the ship like the rudder that you were talking about. I, I think that um, we should include them and um, we, ha we don't have an alternative. So let's do it. Great. And, and we can, I don't know what to say really. We can see we can see the film. I know I know you yeah, was gonna, like people. I'm going to organize the premiere the again, film. like with the Nicovini Truth and with um, Leonardo DiCaprio with the Eleventh Hour and then before the flood and Chasing Eyes and uh, Silence. Can, can you promote uh, our film as well, uh, Alex? Because <laughs> uh, you're oh, yeah. the the best promoter I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> November November 11th. No, because you just told me you're going to premiere the yeah. the Beyond Zero uh, documentary yeah. on Interface. Yeah. Uh, it's it's made it's created by a independent documentary yeah. maker. Uh, it's not Interface, featuring Interface. It's it's a it's a company, a company, uh, and a documentary made by an independent filmmaker. So I think that Interface should not. To have to do anything with it because otherwise it would be it's it would, would for seem, also a big surprise it would, this it would yeah. seem <laughs> propaganda <laughs> it would seem propaganda but i'm gonna organize the premiere on november the 11th wow and everybody in the netherlands 20 one thing will, will be there politics industry society people will be there and youth mm. yeah and from that day on every single company they i won't let them out of the room unless they they install an eco green team and do what in interface has done over the last uh, quarter quarter century mm. you mentioned uh, paul hall control yeah in all of this in that have you paul have you seen paul yeah i've seen paul and i've been uh, emailing with him where are really? you now and uh, and he he left uh, uh, because uh, he he thought it was on no, he, he didn't. didn't. He's there. Oh, is he here? Oh. This was the cliffhanger. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, yeah, Paul, Paul, Paul Hawken, we're so uh, uh, honored that you, you are joining us tonight. Um, you are the editor of Drought and many other books, like, like this uh, book. And the first one, uh, your first book actually was given to me by Roy in the back. Uh, yeah, you can see him. Um, you said, did you know Paul wrote his book on Finthorn? Um, the Magic of Finthorn, it's called. And um, that book actually very much moved me. And funny enough, it was about <laughs> fairies and, and, and nature gods. And, and what, oh, it wasn't about that. It was about all other things. But um, <laughs> so, um, so, Paul, welcome. Uh, welcome. And would you... How do you look back now on on that first book? Would 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 be my question. And how did you how does that led you to draw down and now towards regeneration? Well, I mean, thank you so much. Um, that book came about because I was in New York and one of my customers at my natural food store, Erwan, was Gloria Swanson, the famous movie actress, and um, I'm visited her in her co-op down in Fifth Avenue in New York. And there was a, another guy there uh, who, uh, Clive Baxter, and he was the first person who, um, he was expert in lie detectors and he uses galvanic response machines, you know, and he worked for the CIA 
And one day he was in his office and he looked at a dracaena, a, a house a plant that was there. And he thought, I wonder if plants respond. And so he put the anode and cathode on the plant. And then he thought, because he was a smoker, I'm going to go burn the leaf. And as soon as he thought that, the thing went da 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 da. Wait a minute, you know. So he did a lot of the early research on um, the secret life of plants that Tompkins wrote. He didn't write the book. And so I met him at Glare Swanson and he started talking about Pindhorn. And so I went there and wrote an article and became really popular. And the publisher approached me and said, would you write a book on it? So I did. And that was the first book I had written and published. So that's how the magic of Pindhorn came out. And yes, there were fairies and davids and elves and so forth, but that's, really goes back to a kind of a deeper uh, understanding of Celtic cultures, you know, and which, um, so from Scotland all the way through Ireland, you know, to in the UK, but down into Brittany, Wales and Cornwall and so forth, you know, there had been uh, a very uh, easy relationship with what we would call the the intermediate world, you know. And I mean, there are leprechauns in Ireland, but there are Menehune in Hawaii. But in a sense, they're the same thing. And um, I was fascinated by it because I had read Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries by uh, uh, Evans Wentz, this famous Stanford anthropologist who had uh, 1899 gone to the, all the Celtic countries and just interviewing people about, you know, Davis and fairies and elves and so forth, you know, and it was fascinating. And what he discovered is that the people who had this ability to get in touch with nature spirits, um, as soon as they went to school and were schooled, they lost the ability. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> as soon as they, we're introduced to an education that was empirical, um, then that was the end of that. And so to me, going to Finhorn, to me, there's only two people there, Rock, Robert Ogilvy Crombie and, and Dorothy, who actually, well, Dorothy didn't actually, but only Rock, this one guy who was a friend of Stockhausen and then an amazing scholar lived in uh, uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, excuse me. And, um, he was the only one who actually <clears throat> saw uh, elves and Pan and all this other stuff. And I used to follow him around and, and you know, I didn't see anything. <laughs> but I, watched, I watched him. And one day I was talking to Rock, that's his nickname. He had very big hands, very big hands. I walked behind him. And uh, we go through these wild areas, and then he would say what happened, what he saw, what he encountered, and so forth. And I said, "Did you encounter this by that place or that waterfall or this beech tree?" And so forth. He said, "Yeah, if you did, yeah." I said, "You know what? Every time you do that, your hands go. Your hands are like this. Go out like that. <laughs> Every time, like an antenna." And said, "I couldn't say anything, but he was definitely being an antenna for a, 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 a lost." Mm, let's say cultural um it's not a mystery but it was a capacity ability that was very well um known and understood and since you know my forebears were scottish and cornish uh, uh and also swedish but and but and also from Brittany, so from three of those areas those are my forebears so that's why i was so fascinated by it. Hmm. It was also about gardening, don't forget. It was about gardening. So that was, uh, and I was uh, in the garden. Food business, business, right? You had a company. Yeah, gardening. Yeah. 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 So you, so long, you asked that question. You can be careful of the questions you ask and you get long answers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's exactly what I was expecting. No, uh, there, there, were, there were some people that really inspired everything that we're doing. And, and, you, you you are you are um i mean the, what you've you've actually been able to um to accomplish so to say or to spread or to lay the seeds and and get get out there for us that has really brought 
a lot, really, really a lot. Um, I, I just want to thank you for that. You're so welcome. I mean, I, I'm listening to all you. I've been listening since 11 o'clock. So I've been to every, every presentation in person and so forth. And I've, it, it, we have this phrase in English, like the cat is out of the bag and mm. the cat is out of the climate bag. That's for darn sure. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and nothing will stop it. Uh, nothing can stop it. Uh, it. Somebody mentioned earlier about scaling. It's really a question of, uh, scaling and uh, the rate of literacy and uh, capacity of people to act uh, in a meaningful way. Um, we have everything we need in our toolbox to, to reverse global warming and then some. Um, more will come because there's an amazing amount of participation activity um, I call regenerative agriculture an emergent technology. A lot of people say, well, you know, it's the way they used to farm. Not really, um, in some cases, but um, it, many of the practices do go back. Of course, they go back to Asia, they go back to Africa, they go back to the Milpa Gardens in, in Mesoamerica, no question about it. But what you have now around the world, and, and I would say any country is probably the most innovative is Australia in terms of regen ag. And I think it's because they have uh, the worst problems with water on a broad scale, I could be wrong, but the, 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 the innovation that's going on and the intelligence is extraordinary. And as I say in the new book, it's an emerging technology has more moving parts than an iPhone or anything else you can buy, any other fancy shiny object. Uh, um, and, but those those moving parts are life, and and we don't even have come close to understanding what's going on in the soil um, yet, and I don't think we ever will actually. Mm. Um, but that doesn't mean, I mean, we don't understand how the human body really works. But that doesn't mean you can't be effective as a surgeon or healing and so forth. So we can we can deal with very complex systems, and if we create uh, from our, un, our our mistakes, our learning, our knowledge, and our understanding, so in a shared way, we can create roadmaps and checklists to know exactly what we need to do in order to reverse global warming, while at the same time being in awe of, of the living world. And that means us too. We're the living world. Uh, and so that's why I'm very optimistic about what we'll what could happen and may happen going forward because, um, you know, this movement, I don't think it's even a climate movement because I think the problem with the climate movement, uh, I think even the problem with Drawdown, with all the respect to the book, I not only edited it, I wrote it <laughs> and created it. And the problem with that is that it's falling into the siloing of climate as if there are, these are things we can do. Here's a list. Here's the numbers. You know, the numbers are really, really important. But the reason I want us, regeneration was always meant to be the sequel to, to Drawdown. And the sequel is about the fact that social justice, social injustice, for that matter, and so forth. Uh, and uh, the way we treat each other and the way we think about each other and the way we it is reflected in how we interact and think of nature. And until that is healed and, and, and yield, and until we come back to our senses and so forth, we can have all the technical solutions in the world and we won't get to where we need to go because we're still, the climate movement is still approaching it. I'm not talking about what people spoke of today, but I'm just saying in general, uh, as if there was uh, a symptom and we have a cure. They're gonna fix it. It, what's it? There is no it there. Find climate. You can't. And so what we have still, and you'll see it at COP, the Conference of the Parties, you'll see it uh, in the corporate commitments to net zero, you see it everywhere, is that we're still looking at climate change as other, like it's something else, different, separate from who we are, from our lives, you know, and so forth. And definitely we have to do something about it. 
But even then we have to step back and say, you know, as, as reinforcing and as lovely it is to get together and listen to each other, share and hear new things and so forth. The fact is that 98% of humanity is disengaged from doing anything about climate. 98%. Okay. So how do we do that? How did that happen after 45, 50 years of, you know, being uh, in the public sphere, the science and the understanding and so forth, especially in the last 10, 20 years. And, and yeah, I mean, as I say too, you know, you can, there's no difference between a climate denier and your close friend who really is worried about climate and thinks about it and talks about it and watches documentaries about it, but doesn't do anything. It's the same thing from the Earth's point of view. And so our challenge is not only to understand what we can do in terms of the presentation earlier, I call it carbon architecture, but basically uh, buildings that embody carbon instead of um, uh, emit it in the construction. We know what to do, but what we haven't been able to do now is make the bridge to the needs of most of the people in the world. And that's because so much of the, of the languaging has been around uh, addressing future existential threats. You know, there's a threat coming, it's coming, it's in the future, it's existential, right, great. That doesn't mean anything for most people in the world, nothing whatsoever, because most of the world, we're very privileged people. Um, we live in a very privileged countries, although I think America is actually a failed, a rich failed state, but that's another conversation. <laughs> but we, we are privileged people and what we don't understand, uh, in my opinion, uh, is really what most people face on a daily basis. And so if the climate movement, if you want to call it that, if it isn't, um, if it doesn't, if it's not meeting current human needs, it's not serious. It is not serious. I mean, there's 4 billion people in the world who are poor. And when the, 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 the World Bank says, if you make $2 a day, $1.90 a day, you're extremely poor. If you make $2 a day, what, you're not? And uh, basically 4 billion people are poor. If you make $2 a day, you can't even, after a month, if you save all that money, you can't even buy a Lululemon bra, okay? I mean, the way we have, you know, basically objectified uh, the, the, these human beings, you know, all over the world, you know, oh, well, they're poor, they're extremely poor, they're this or that and so forth, you know, and, and then have a climate movement that basically is running really amongst the top quintile decile of the world and so forth, you know, and uh, we have to anneal that. And as I've said, you know, if, if, if we want to save the earth, we have to make an earth a world worth saving. And if we're going to address global warming, um, we have to meet current human needs, not existential threats, you know, um, and so regeneration is very much about the fact that what I would say is inextricable is inextricable, which is life in all its myriad forms, whether it's technology or whether it's an indigenous tribe or whether it's a forest or whether um, it is the atmosphere itself, which is very much alive, full of bacteria uh, living up there and coming around and so forth. You name it, it's all one system of life that is so infinitely complex. And as, you know, uh, uh, as people who, who see and understand the problem, we have to now, I think, understand that, why is it that we're not engaging the rest of humanity? And, and, and we look at that and, and, and be honest with ourselves, not questioning what anybody does, you know, myself included and so forth, so much as, are we communicating in such a way that people can understand it? And if we don't communicate in a way that an average ninth grader anywhere in the world or eighth grader can understand exactly what we're saying, then we're just talking acronyms and jargon. And that's not going to work. So we have to talk in the way we saw that, that, that the clip of Angari Mantai, that's how you talk. That's how you talk. I mean, 
those women knew exactly what she was saying. She didn't go into ecosystem, you know, or, uh, you know, services, or, you know, all that stuff. She, she was right there at the core of women's aspirations, needs, and uh, uh, and so that's really where the I think the the we have to go with climate. So and and, and also to understand that so much of what we do, if not virtually everything, um, actually we'd want to do if climate was not a problem, and we can take the word climate away. Let's just do it. Let's build better homes. Let's build better farms. Let's build more nutrient dense food. Let's restore the ocean. I mean, you can just go on, right on, check, 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 check. Let's make living wage jobs to give people purpose and dignity, check. You know, let's restore the 2 billion acres of degraded land. How many people will that take? A lot, check. Why, why, not why, but what will they do? They will bring it back to life. You know, and so regeneration, uh, the definition of the one I use in the book anyway, and I'm sure there's others and so forth, is putting life at the center of every action and decision. That's regeneration. And so what it means is that everything we do, we look at it from that point of view. Are we going this way? Are we going that way? Because we know that we, and this was spoken to earlier, and uh, um, that we live in a very, um, uh, what's the word, just out of control, materialist economy, <laughs> it's all out of control. But if we go underneath and like, what does it do? What does it actually do? Every economic sector in the world right now, every economic sector is extracted. It is an extraction machine. It is taking. And we even do it in social media, Facebook. It's a take. Google's a take. You know, Instagram's a take. It's not an offer. It's not a gift. It's a take. You know, they're extracting people's uh, desires and so forth and reselling them and so forth. But so anytime you extract in the world, you are harming life. That's called, that's what degeneration is. And we know whether it's the biodiversity people or oceanographers or you name it, that that road doesn't go much further. I mean, that road, you can see the end of that road and we're still driving along as if there's, that road's going to keep going. It's not. And so regeneration is like, stop, got it. No, not blaming, pointing fingers. The lawsuit is great, but I, I mean, not demonizing. That doesn't work. And saying, what does it mean to regenerate? What does that mean? And that is an enlarging conversation that includes all the things we're doing around climate change, but at the same time um, expands the opportunity and the uh, engagement and the possibility and the potential for people all around the world who are not benefiting from this juggernaut economy and who are oftentimes paying the highest price for the volatility and the disruption that's happening with respect to weather and climate um, to flip that so that the engine or the vanguard uh, of climate uh, activism is coming from the bulk of humanity and not, you know, uh, um, us, frankly. I mean, I'll be really honest with you, us, you know, everything needs a Every arrow needs a tip, okay? So nothing wrong with the tip of an arrow. It's just that it's, it needs the feathers all the way in the back as well. <laughs> it needs to be, otherwise it won't go anywhere and won't do anything. And so that's what we're talking about. In, and it's what Damon is doing so well, Damon Gamo in, in Australia. I mean, it's being done. And I don't want to say that I know you don't or they don't and you know, listen up. I don't know either how to make this thing happen. All I know is that with drawdown and with regeneration, the purpose of both was to create the conditions for self-organization. And I just look at what Roy has done with drawdown Europe and what Sven, what you are doing and so forth. And you translate the book, you used it and so forth. You're using it. Uh, it's, it's referred to, it's employed, and so forth. That's what I'm talking about. No, it's you, did, you, me, anybody, all of us, we just create the conditions. People know what to do if they have 
the right tools, the right knowledge, and so forth. And so uh, our job isn't, I think, collectively to organize the world. Our job is to enable the world. And nothing enables the world, I think, more powerfully than uh, regeneration. Yeah, Paul, a, a great story again. And I'd like to thank you for all your work the last years and all the lessons I've learned. But the last 15 minutes, there were three lessons. Uh, and I'd like to uh, add on that. Uh, maybe the first lesson is your way of moving your fingers on particular moments you're Air talking. Quotes. Air quotes. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But, but that's very important because you did it on some very special moments. So um, the, the first, le that was my first lesson uh, tonight. The second was the, the cat is out of the bag. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a great. Uh, we have in, the, in Dutch, we have, if we buy a cat in the bag, you did a very uh, 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 bad deal. So uh, <laughs> the, the cat is out of the bag. I think it's better. And the last lesson I'll, I've learned, because the regeneration and the re-thing, if you take the English dictionary, you can find almost, I think, 350 words start with re. And uh, regenerate is a very important one. Forget religion and retired, but all the other <laughs> one you can use. And I think the most important uh, reword for tonight, because of all your work, you start rethinking again your own work and rethinking. And I think that's our lesson. Let's rethink the people. We are happy people working on a better world. Rethink our work every day because of all other people. They don't have the feeling to can do something about it. We have to rethink it again. So thank you very much for that lesson. You're so welcome. I mean, when when I decided to do Drawdown in 2013, I did it because it had never been done. Can you, could somebody just give me the numbers? I want to know the solutions. How do they rank? What's the impact? What do they cost? It was, and I asked that question over and over again, starting in 2001, actually. actually. And so 2000, it still hadn't been done in 2013. And so a group of us got together and we did it and so forth. And it was published. Right. But here's the thing. And it may sound contradictory. Numbers do not change behavior. Okay, they don't change people. They do not. However, in the new book, we have numbers too, not on the pages, but in the back and so forth. But numbers, data, accuracy, you know, fidelity to fact is the floor. It's the floor. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to dance, you need a good floor. Yeah. So really, it's about how do we dance, you know? Expression. And that's why the numbers are so important. I'm not downplaying them whatsoever so much as, as I'm just saying, yeah, we're, you know, I want to make sure that Drado never got, you know, sort of uh, kneecapped by some scientists, you know, saying, oh, you screwed the boots, you know, you dropped a decimal point, you blah, 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 you know, because science is a gotcha community. I don't know if you have that word in gotcha, but gotcha means Gotcha, you know, got you. Yeah. And, and even the moonwalk needs a floor. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so, so numbers and data and science, that's our, that is our floor, you know. But now let's dance. And I love that celebratory quality and the joy and the laughter that I heard today um, in this event. It's, it, that's really, really important. Let's dance. Let's you mentioned uh, Damon. Damon is uh, Damon Gamo is with us. Uh, Linda just on. scribbled on this piece of paper. Yeah, I, uh, I thought he wasn't there, but. Uh, come on, no, I see him. He's right here. Oh, oh he's right there. Oh, yeah, I can really? see him. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Hey, Damon. Hello. Well, Damon is How from Australia. You? You? Just got up. It's early. It's very early in the morning in Australia, but I'm here and I'm present and willing. All the way from <laughs> Australia. Tang, uh, uh, can you show us uh, where you where where in Australia? Because uh, well, I'm not sure if Damon is exactly at, at this point, but I think that uh, there's a regeneration group of the movie, and that's right at the uh, the, the point of uh, Australia, so really at the bottom. But I don't think uh, Damon, you're at this uh, particular place, right? No, no, I'm I'm in Sydney at the moment, but. Um... 
can report that the regeneration movement is is growing and and developing in, in our country um, for a, a variety of reasons, as Paul mentioned, uh, because of our ancient soils and our ability and, and requirement to hold more water. We're about ten percent of our farmers now are using regenerative agriculture practices um, and really pioneering in the space, both men and women, uh, indigenous groups, First Nations people, growing ancient grains and bush foods and trying to develop a market here. So uh, there's a lot of positivity happening here. And uh, despite sort of the lack of action that we're getting from our federal government, uh, people are really taking it upon themselves to get involved, to find what they can do in their own communities and, uh, and move forward in a regenerative manner. Yeah. And Damon, uh, last year, uh, when we started our uh, 1500 Club, we did it uh, with the premiere of your movie in the Netherlands. So uh, we want to thank you for, for that and for uh, producing and, and, uh, this film and making all those uh, interviews. And what do you and think? And also thank your daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 How is Velvet actually doing? <laughs> well, it's good. She's, she's seven now, but she's got a little sister. So she's uh, learning some complex emotions around jealousy <laughs> and sharing. <laughs> um, doing okay. <laughs> and what's the impact of 2040 around the world? What do you think of your movie? Uh, well, it's a tricky one to measure, I, I suppose. Um, there's a few different metrics. If you just look at it purely as a sort of a box office or in, uh, engagement, that's been incredibly successful. It's, it's now in the top three highest grossing documentaries of all time in Australia, um, but has played right through Europe now in the US uh, on various streaming platforms and 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 screen for government organisations. But what I would say is the most success is our impact campaign. So uh, our community has brought to life many of the solutions that you saw in the film uh, by doing equity crowdfunding or just simply donating, uh, teachers downloading and sharing the curriculum materials with the students. Uh, so that's the thing I'm the most proud of. It. And you know, some of the governments that have seen the film around the world have now discussing serious implementation of some of those solutions at a very large scale. So I guess, as Paul alluded to, it speaks to the importance of storytelling, which we often underestimate in this space. And we do uh, resort to the, the statistics, which are, as Paul said, useful, but sometimes lifeless. We need to encase those statistics in engaging and magical narratives to bring more people along. So I think we've got some very strong evidence of that, that people are ready to hear about solutions, to be inspired by what communities and other individuals are doing around the world uh, to motivate them into action and, and get on board. Um, because um, if we do that, as we know, we can, we can all uh, create enormous change. Yeah, and more and more people are uh, getting on board. How is your uh, seaweed plantation doing uh, in Tasmania? I followed this crowdfunding uh, maybe yeah. one and a half years ago, or and and I, I was very uh, intrigued by it because you also t told the story about the uh, the climate warming up, the water warming up over there is uh, it, it it goes very uh, <laughs> it's much warmer already than uh, it should be, and so I'm curious, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Tasmania is warming uh, almost four, about four degrees warmer than the rest of the country, which is you know obviously very concerning, and so there. Biodiversity is changing rapidly, and one of the impacts there was we used to have giant kelp forests uh, along the east coast of Australia and the west coast. Uh, but the kelp forest in Tasmania, beautiful long uh, kelp, uh, about 95% of that uh, has been lost in the last few years. Um, so obviously, with that, a huge impact on the ecosystem and, and fish life, and affecting uh, jobs and industry and the ecosystem, obviously. But so uh, working with Brian, who appeared in the film, who I met through Paul uh, by first reading Project Drawdown, uh, we worked with the University of Tasmania down there and put out a crowd fund for the community and raised uh, you know, over a million dollars to develop the first seaweed platform uh, down there in the waters. And we did, I guess we, we, we grew the, the baby kelp first to make sure they were resilient in the warmer temperatures. And that proved to be very successful. And then we planted them uh, in two sites uh, about eight months ago. And as seaweed does, as we know, um, the seaweed is now over 10 metres long in that eight months and has uh, withstand swells of up to 10 metres in the last year. Uh, and which is really interesting is that we did two 
sites and the test, the control site was actually done attached to a salmon farm there, like an industrial salmon farm, which has been quite controversial down here because of the damage that it's doing to the waterways in Tasmania. But the seaweed actually grew much faster next to those pens because it was absorbing the nitrates that were coming off that pen. So that company uh, is actually really interested in getting involved now because I guess it becomes a secondary income stream for them. But uh, the seaweed can act as a filtration system for them and it could be a win-win. Um, so it, it's very interesting. There's a lot to do in terms of the engineering of the upwelling. That's still a process that's about to start in July. Um, but, you know, in my country, there has been a, a now a seaweed national, now national Seaweed Institute, which didn't exist two years ago, and they have about 21 tenders in uh, for people to build commercial-scale seaweed farms around the country. That's the first one down in South Australia is doing the asparagopsis to feed to the cattle farmers. And that government want to be um, you know, carbon neutral by 2035 um, and, and make sure they're feeding the seaweed to, to the cattle and the livestock. So there's a lot of momentum in this space. And as we know, around the rest of the world, there's, there's a bit of a flurry of activity with seaweed. And, and as I mentioned before, a couple of governments looking at some very, very large projects. But obviously, we need to treat them all very carefully and make, make sure there's no uh, unforeseen deleterious impacts down the track. So those discussions are taking place now, which is very encouraging. Yeah. So you're into storytelling. You're into actually doing by helping uh, ground, uh, crowdfunding uh, this plantation, the seaweed plantation. What are you working on right now? Are, a, a new story, a new film, or what? What are we going? Uh, what can we expect from you? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a juggle. There's a few different things going on, and I think that speaks to the momentum in this space right now. Uh, I've been, you know, very lucky to have spent a lot of time with Paul in the last uh, year and a half, um, and and developing some interesting projects there around you know new platforms or new ways of engaging uh, stories and and learning and connecting people to each other that are starting to join this movement and get involved and making sure they're really equipped with the, with the adequate skills to get involved and, and do the necessary work. Uh, in Australia, I'm doing a project uh, called Regenerate Australia at the moment, and it's been a year of uh, interviewing people right around the country after our bushfires and obviously COVID and, and asking them what kind of Australia they want to see emerge from this time. What does our country look like in its best form uh, over the next 10 years? And then I've, uh, I've, we've started filming two weeks ago. I'm in Sydney now filming, and it's been really beautiful. The, the, the format is uh, set as a news report in 2029, uh, looking back at the decade that was in our country. And we're using real journalists, very recognisable, commercial, well-known journalists, and all sorts of uh, fabricated uh, press conferences and interviews with people showing the benefits of the implementation of these solutions. So asking people what impact it had on their community when these jobs were brought to their town, uh, revegetating landscapes, what, what happens when we bring that back? And, and people are so willing to sit in that space five or six years ahead and actually let themselves dream and suspend disbelief and talk about all the insects coming back and hitting the windscreens again like they did in the 80s or the amount of birds that have returned or being able to just cycle through your city and pick fruit. Like people are really willing to, to go there and, and, and imagine that beautiful world. So uh, it's been a, a fascinating piece to put together. And what's very encouraging is that as we release the film later this year around the country, uh, a, a number of organisations have put together what is a very large amount of money now so that once communities see this film, if they resonate with any of the solutions, there is a fund that can go to them straight away to actually implement it and get going uh, and take the risk out of it for other investors to come in. Uh, but really, you know, these, some of these communities have great ideas, but they don't have the money to do the feasibility study with their energy company. So this just allows them to get going and start and then we'll document uh, their work and, and how what's working, what are the barriers, and then share that with other communities around the country so that we can really create this um, community-led recovery. It's not a, a, a hierarchy or a top-down command and control. It's very much regenerative in, that, in those principles that it's a decentralised uh, community grass-led movement. So, um, yeah, getting wonderful support for that. People are very open and willing uh, to tell this new story for our country in particular. Yeah, yep. so... Really scaling up. And uh, we would like to connect you, uh, Damon, and also Paul, to uh, 
a couple of young guys uh, also in uh, our Zoom uh, room, like Sam and Ryan, who are actually also trying to uh, scale up uh, by using platforms and newsletters and, and are, are really uh, talented and, uh, uh, on, on doing that. And um, since we, one of the things we have to do is connect the dots, it would be great if we could connect some dots tonight and uh, see all these great people working around the world. And Tain has put, has put everyone on the map. So <laughs> we can see you all really exist and you're there. And uh, now I see Sam, for example, who's been working on this solution game. Uh, so it's uh, based on uh, drawdown. And um, well, Sam, th this is your, and one of your gifts to the world, uh, and, you, and you've also got a platform uh, that's called Work on Climate, and where you bring lots of people together to work, actually to work on climate. And um, yeah, your solutions game, that's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, we played it virtually, and not, not, not yet really with the cards. We have them here, you, you, you send them over. And uh, so it's about the drawdown solutions and the rankings and getting, uh, you, uh, you get nice discussions about, oh, I didn't know that seaweed uh, is, is such a big solution or whatever. And uh, yeah, uh, and you're on the, you're almost uh, uh, crowdfunding your, the, your, your game, Sam. Uh, when are you going to start your crowdfunding? That's right. Yeah, we, we, don't have a final date yet, but it should be in a few weeks. So there's a lot of moving parts here, but um, around June 1st or mid-June. Okay, shall we take a look at, at your little kickstart video we, uh, uh, we made? It's, it. uh, we have to get people uh, awake upstairs. They're, they didn't, uh, they <laughs> we didn't take a look at a video for quite some time, but it's, um, we have it. It's called Solutions. Solutions. Ah! Effort. Ah! Ah! Whoa! <laughs> now the new climate change report just released, ramping up urgent warnings of a severe threat Scientists have identified the key ways in which we humans are destroying the ecosystems on which we depend. There are over a hundred incredible and surprising solutions to our climate crisis, and there's still real hope for the future of our planet. The problem is, these solutions are locked up in stuffy books and academic papers. So, we've turned them into a board game. The game is just the beginning. If any solution gets you curious or motivated, you can scan the QR code on the back of the card to learn more and even take real-world action, like a school in Palm Beach, Florida did after playing the game. I was really excited about playing the solutions game with my students. We decided to reduce food waste at our school cafeteria. The game inspired the students who then inspired the administration to make a bigger impact right here at school. And that's why we're reducing the food waste. It really is a great learning tool for my students, even as a confident climate communicator. Um, this really helped me in my classroom and it helped inspire the next generation to act on behalf of our planet. Join us to spark conversations that matter and hope for the future while having fun along the way. Yeah, so Sam, that really looks great. And at Climate Cleanup, uh, we're really looking forward to uh, playing this game with lots and lots of audiences and, and get it out in, in Europe and in the Netherlands as well. And uh, is Paul still in the room? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, what, I mean, do you, what do you think of the game? I love it, I love it. Um, it, it goes back to fun. You learn when you have fun. Uh, when we were children, you know, there was a sandbox where they were fighting and a sandbox where they were giggling. You went to the sandbox where people are giggling. 
and we're all children in that way. <laughs> we still are. And um, and I, I mean, with due respect, I would not. I wouldn't call them drawdown solutions. They're solutions. They're solutions. They came from all over the world and so forth. And their uh, their pedigree belongs with people and organizations and NGOs and farmers and you know and and, and people who've been imagining and so forth. And so um, you know the drawdown was is there because we should name the goal, which is to reverse global warming for sure and so forth. But I think we really want to make sure that. We get and Sam and I have talked about this, and you know he agrees, and so on. That, on that. But I just think, you know, we, we really want to make this universal. What I mean, what, what Dame is doing, Dame is doing in Australia is really amazing, and so forth in terms of the regenerators and the ways presenting it. And I think that that both the game and and uh, and Dame's works, which he can't really show, I guess, right, right this moment, but what he's doing. Is creating that sense of wonder and magic, and I want to get involved. Or who are those people? And I think the game can do the same thing. And and as I said, there's a very interesting thing. And I'm going off probably on too long, but you know, uh, the sky. There's a there's a book called The Sky We Make. You know, and uh, the author, um, who's a climate scientist, uh, said what she noticed is that the climate deniers are very loud, you know, and very vociferous and so forth. But she, who's a climate scientist, and all her friends who are climate literate, were not talking about it. And they all just assume, you know, well, you know, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're all cool. <laughs> but we weren't talking about it. I'm, I'm with that too. My friends, we go to dinner, we wouldn't talk about climate. The majority of the world has to start talking about it. it has to start talking about it. And, and how can you create conversations that they want to engage in? And what Sam's doing is a way to do that. What Damon's doing in Australia is a way of doing that. That's the key. That's the key. This, this touching into what makes us more human you know, or makes us human, period. Yeah. yeah. And someone else who's also doing that is the young uh, Ryan Hagen, who's also in, uh, in Zoom from uh, uh, Boston, near Boston. He has this newsletter uh, going out to 140,000 people and wow. uh, crowdsourcing sustainability. Uh, and uh, Ryan, uh, where, where do you find so much energy to get this out every time? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. But yeah, so just for some quick context, crowdsourcing sustainability is a, a nonprofit with a newsletter that reaches over 150,000 people in 150 plus countries. And we also have a podcast and a Slack community built on top of those two things. And kind of big picture, um, what we're doing, and, and Paul said this earlier, actually, he said, you know, the cat's out of the bag and that a big part of what we need to do now is about increasing climate literacy and the capacity of people to act in a meaningful way. And so that's really a, a good way to say what we're doing. We're working to inform minds, touch hearts, and inspire action and em empower people, trying to help shape culture, get these conversations going, and build people power around the world at every level. Yeah, great, Ryan. And um, I don't know what to add to all the all all all, all of you and. Uh... <laughs> Well, yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I say something? I just interrupt. Um, yeah. I've been on Zoom for almost eight hours uh, today. <laughs> I started at uh, uh, six a.m. actually uh, with Europe in Europe and, and so forth. And I'm really hungry. And so I <laughs> me too, Paul. I'm also hungry, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I don't, but I don't want to leave the conversation. But I'm starving. Uh, oh. But I do want to say the conversation this morning at 6 a.m. was with uh, Nestle's and uh, they are starting Generation Regeneration. That's their motto and tag and focus and purpose and, and they're serious. And I know them and they have, they deal with 600,000 farms in the world. 
most of them smallholders. And um, it was really beautiful to listen to the literacy and the understanding and the commitment and the, uh, of the, the largest food company in the world, you know. Uh, and the only difference between them and other large food companies is that they don't make ultra processed foods much at all. Unlike Pepsi and Coke and you know and the others, and uh, the other thing about them is that they're focusing. I'm talking about ancient grains, Damon. You know, they're focusing on ancient ingredients. And the head of the company, now Mark Schneider, came from the the traditional so-called healthcare industry, which I don't think is healthcare. But no. anyway, um, but. Now they're focusing on nutrition. They had a bad go 20 plus years ago in Africa with baby formula, you know, I mean, and still are wearing that scarlet letter. Um, but they are now focusing on nutrition. And that means farming. That means nutrient density. That means, you know, listening to people like Ryan and the people who are subscribers and really completely changing what it means to be a food company uh, going forward. And I, I, I mention all that only because uh, I think regeneration is a burgeoning movement. You know, it, it's it just, it's growing like crazy, even if it's not called regeneration. That's not necessary to be regenerated to even know the word. Um, it, what's necessary is to do, is to care. And, and, and to relate and to connect. And um, so I wanna thank you all so, so, so much. I wish I could stay um, and learn more and listen. And, and, but I really need to, cause I have a staff meeting in an hour or two, so. Huh. Uh, <laughs> thank you very yeah. much, Paul. We know you're, you are thank incredibly you. busy with, um, uh, with finishing. Just today, with finishing. just today. You chose the day that Oh, would, you're busy today. No, it wasn't like that. But you're finishing I, your uh, your uh, the book, right? Today, I'm supposed to be, I, I'm supposed to finish that today as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I thought I was going to have it finished, so I said yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us, and uh, okay. let's dance. Okay, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. And uh, Tain. Do you still have uh, every, everyone on the map? <laughs> yes, what can I we do? do? Um, well, what we what we can do, we created a uh, climate action plan, or uh, maybe you can better call it regeneration action plan. Um, and this is where we uh, provide some resource, uh, resources to really enable people to work on, on solutions. And that's what Paul said. We need to enable people to work on solutions. And this is the, the web page we made that we think that could possibly help and also uh, show uh, the resources that were uh, talked about during this uh, this evening. So uh, Yeah, well, you did a great job actually at not only putting everyone on the map, but also making making uh, uh, this page, but most of all, uh, connecting most, a, a lot of the people who've been here uh, tonight, uh, like uh, Ryan, like Sam, and, and many, many others. So um, uh, thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. Great work. <laughs> yeah. And um, so it's my turn. It's your turn. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, dear viewers, uh, just scan this QR code and get yourself on the map. <laughs> so uh, let's join time. And um, if you're not a member uh, yet, uh, please be welcome. Um, and let's regenerate and rethink our work. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. A little, a little thank you to uh, everyone um, who made this possible, um, if I may, which are uh, Ruth, Roos, Hornstra, uh, Harmedes, Tantjouk, Linda Vosjan, Jasmin Salvatore, Philippe Filela, uh, Daniel De Niel, Koleemans, Le Le Joost Wouters, Marcel Kemper, Sandra Nap, Marcel van der Peppel, Lies Tostenbos, Erik Matsner, um, Climate Envoy, Marcel Beukeboom, Roy Straver. Where's Roy? Already drinking. Great. Uh, Reinhard Augustijn, Andy Dockert. Um, we didn't saw you. Matthea de Jong, uh, we didn't see you, but um, uh, Janneke Lenaars, <laughs> Maurits Groen, Paul Hawken, again. Um, Damon Gamow, are you there still? Thank you, Damon, <laughs> for getting up at six o'clock. Uh, Sam, Levac Levé, Wietse Slop, also Ryan Hagen, or is it Hagen? More Hagen. 
And of course, um, all of the participants and our guests, and last not but least, Linda, um, all the members of the 1500 Club. Yeah. All of us, I might say, and um, for making this possible, let's, um, yeah, the cat is out of the bag. The cat is out of the bag. <laughs> let's dance in double nature. Yeah, and join Paul. We were not. The, yeah, let's enjoy our drinks. And well, it was not only the birthday of and our fifteen hundred club of our fifteen hundred club, but also it is today Sven's birthday. And so I asked Sven's partner, "What is Sven appreciating?" And uh, she said, "What he appreciates are and I have I had to." Look it up in English what it is. Cufflinks. Cufflinks. Oh, yeah. You know what it is? <laughs> I know what cufflinks is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, uh, what we uh, did, and uh, we have to thank some members for it. For, for example, Paul uh, Knopt, who uh, came up with uh, olivine stones. <laughs> and uh, there's an artist here in the room, Anki de Groot, uh, who uh, did, the, did the jewelry. And uh, and and we did your initials in it, so you can give it can can stay in the family, and uh, and we hope uh, you're going to wear it now and then, and um, and the box is made by one of our members, uh, Marianne Kuipers of Blue Blocks, and uh, well she she yo take a look Sven, uh, and and so there's lots of work of all kinds of talents who are in the room now. Is in this box, and this is this is for your birthday. Happy birthday! Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> the only uh, the biggest gift is to get together and work on solutions. Really, with all of you, it's a um, <laughs> it's so it's so beautiful. Yeah. This, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and I'll uh, I'll show show. I'll have to show. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. In the form of leaf. There's um ha. Huh. Reminds me of Buck Mr. Fuller again, who said, like, uh, if there's, uh, I don't look for beauty in solutions, but if I have got a solution and it's not beautiful, uh, uh, but if, if if I make a solution and it's beautiful, I know it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so, Let's drink uh, to that. Thank you. And um, Gerbrand, Oudenaarde, and the crew at uh, Studio. Great job. Yeah. Thanks thank you. a lot. Thanks for uh, great work. Oh. Cheers. Yes. Cheers. <laughs> nou, je gezondheid, hè? <laughs> Mooi. Ik er niet bij.